the Know Your Gear podcast. Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome to the Know Your Gear podcast episode. I don't know what episode this is. <laughs> episode something. All right. Where am I? Can you see me? Can I see you guys? Uh, and let's see. All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, as always, I want to thank you guys for joining me live. And, of course, I also thank people to watch the rebroadcast. Uh, as always, I want to point out a couple things. If you see somebody with, in a blue name with a blue wrench, it means they're a moderator. They're here to kind of help facilitate questions and help with small uh, issues and things. I'm looking at multiple things at the same time here right now. Uh, and also, they can kind of funnel me extra questions and stuff if I miss something. Uh, so, in fact, I will... Uh, adjust that so I can see it. That's probably important. And then also, if you see somebody with a green name, that means they're a channel member and they're just like my patrons, uh, which support this episode, which is 340 episodes supported and sponsored by viewers and not companies, which as uh, I'm very proud to say. It's very, very cool to say. And uh, So uh, thank you so much for all of you guys who are coming, hanging out, supporting. And remember, everything's a, everything is a sense of uh, sign of support. So a thumbs up, a hanging out here live, watching the rebroadcast, a subscription, a patron, a member. It's all It all really uh, helps the channel, and I appreciate all of you guys doing that. We have a lot of things to talk about. Uh, I kind of uh, don't know where to start. <laughs> so I might just grab some early the early riser questions. I do have questions that came in through the week. If you do want to get a question to me during the week as a potential to be on the show, it, you go to the Know Your Gear Podcast, uh Dot com. It's our website. You go there and it just has a little submit a question. You could go there. As, uh, it, uh, there you go. <laughs> That's how you do it. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's grab the first question. The first question came from Chris, and uh, it was the very first question today on the live show, and it said, what year is your N4? He's talking about my uh, Nuno Bittencourt N4 uh, right there. I have two Nuno Bittencourt N4s. Um, the other one you've seen is a green swirl. I had it painted, and then this one is a stock one. Um, this one, I don't know the year exactly, if I was going to guess, 2000. 20, 2021, 2019. Um, I, I haven't looked to actually seen it. Um, but the, the green one is a 2000, I want to say it's a 2008 or nine. So I, I don't know if I ever uh, mentioned this, but the green swirl Nuno Bincourt uh, in four that I have, the reason it is painted green swirl, the reason it's painted is it originally started its life. It's a very depressing story. So, you know, it started its life as a Nuno Bincourt uh, limited, very limited edition in four called the wrap and wrap meaning R A P like wrapping. Okay. Not like wrapping paper, but like wrapping. And that's standard for Randall amplifier project. So if you haven't seen, uh, Nuno Bitten courts, um, hold on a second. I'm going to show it to you real quick. Cause this, this is, uh, uh, Nuno Bettencourt has an amplifier with uh, Randall, and it is a very special design. I'm going to show it to you. Click on that so we can share. Here it is. This is what it looks like. It's got his uh, his uh, tattoo. This is the tattoo he has on his arm. Uh, I think it's on his arm. And anyways, this is his amplifier. And if we go back, you know, they have a combo, and they had cabinets. And I wonder what happens if I type in guitar... Been court amp guitar and see if a picture comes up and it doesn't this is how rare it is and i do have pictures of it um so here's the story it goes like this there's a nuno bittencourt guitar I'll, I'll see while i'm talking let me go back to me and while i'm talking let me look in my photos to see if i actually uh have a picture because i'll share it if i have the picture i can share it real time so anyways uh during the recession uh nuno or uh, uh randall uh Randall and Washburn, same company at the time, uh, came out with a uh, Nuno Bincourt amplifier. And to, I guess, commemorate this or to to uh, make it exciting, they did a very limited run of Nuno in fours with uh, that paint job. That The guitar was painted to look just like the amp. It was really cool paint job. I'm looking right now. I do have a picture. I just don't know if it's actually in my phone or if it's archived out. I, I'll probably have to find it. Maybe have to show it a different time. Um, I do apologize. Anyways, um, so what happens is uh, I bought it. In fact, I bought the one that the president of Washburn Guitars had hanging in his office. Um, 
the company, like a lot of companies during the recession was not doing very well and they were just trying to sell anything they could and they put it on uh, Reverb or eBay, I don't remember which one. And I'm gonna try and see if I can put in for uh, to find this guitar. And it's just so, like I said, it's so rare and I'm not seeing it, I apologize. So let me go back. So uh, anyways, I bought this guitar. It was extremely limited and it was, at the time, I wanna say it was like $1,400, uh, which is a lot of money. I mean, $1,400, I mean, it's a lot of money now, but back then it was like, ooh, $1,400 even more. And so anyways, um, I bought the guitar and, and I loved it. It was uh, the, my favorite in four ever in history, and not only the way it looks, but also the way it played. Here's what happened. The paint started flaking off, it just started flaking off the guitar. <laughs> um, big hunks of it just chipped off. And it's like, it's like basically, it looked like the, the wood shrank and the paint just stayed. <laughs> It's the same shape, and it was like like an M and M shell that had a crack in it, and it started flaking off, and I was pretty bummed about that, and uh, so I go, well, let me let me sand it down to an actual you know in four uh, alder body guitar, and long story short, I thought, well, you know, before I do that, why don't I see if I can get it painted something else cool and if it doesn't work i can always sand that down to the wood guitar because it's just going to be a wood guitar so i had uh it painted in the uh the, the green swirl and i thought that'd be cool right because i didn't have a swirl guitar and i always wanted one and so that's why it was painted in the swirl so that's why it's painted so a lot of people are like why did you paint your in for i i did it because i just had to do something with it because it was it was uh, and it was actually easier to uh sand just rough sand that off and and, and then basically paint it than it would have been took it down to wood um, so that's why I have the Greens World in four. Uh, I was actually funny enough. I had a patron hang out yesterday. <laughs> it was like three and a half hours or something. And then we talked about this guitar. So it's kind of like I'm having deja vu. Uh, somebody asked me about this guitar. This guitar exists because, um, as I do videos over the years, uh, for pedals and, and all kinds of things, you know, little amplifiers, uh, you know, um, a lot of times these companies, uh, don't want the product back. So sometimes they send you the product and they say like, keep it as a compensation kind of thing. And then sometimes, believe it or not, they just don't want it back. It's just not worth their time to pay to ship it. And, you know, uh, sometimes, especially, uh, especially if you're doing with companies overseas where they, they don't really want to pay to ship it all the way back overseas. So you have, I accumulate all this gear and I keep it for a period of time, obviously. And, um, so what I will do with that gear a lot of times is if I'm, uh, I'll be traveling around or if I'm around town or whatever, and I see something cool at a music store. Oh, you know what? Thank you, crew. Somebody, he said, search for Nuno Bentcourt tattoo guitar. So thank you. And let me get rid of all the other stuff. I won't lose pra uh. Aha! Good job, buddy. All right, here it is. This is the guitar. So it was painted like it was, this is gold and it was, it's all painted. There's no rap graphic because I know it's painted because I obviously kind of deep kind of fell apart. So I got to see all the layers. So this was the guitar that I had it actually like that. That's why the hardware is also black too. It was like just made this way. It's a really cool guitar. So anyways, uh, back to what I was saying about uh, where this in came from. Uh, if I go to a music store sometimes and they have something cool, um, what I'll do is I'll just, I'll bring them a pile of stuff. And, and sometimes I did it the way I did this. I wasn't looking for an N4. I actually had a pile of stuff. I went to a music store and I said, hey, I have this stuff. And they would look at it and, I, and we kind of figure out what it's worth. And then once I get it, they give me a number, I'll go around their store and look for something that I think is valuable that I can have and put away in, in, in kind of like put away in the closet, so to speak, until I can sell it or use it if they don't have something I want. And so what happens, that's where I got that guitar. So that guitar, that N4, I, I keep pointing at it right here. This N4, it's a newer one. Um, definitely a newer one and um it came with a case and everything and i've played it maybe two or three times and um it'll just eventually go <laughs> it's it's really it's like it's just the long tedious thing about you know doing the youtube gig sometimes you get paid in trinkets and then you sell those trinkets or if you can't sell them you trade them off and uh you trade them towards one thing and it just makes it easier to not have a pile of stuff in a closet but one nice guitar or one nice amplifier waiting for it to eventually go or i'll trade it off to someone for something else and then uh sometimes that works too 
So there's just all kinds of stuff to do with that. And like I said, sometimes I'll take that stuff and trade it for other things that I can just use on the channel review. But, and so, you know, I actually thought about doing a video about that in four. Um, and I, uh, Sweetwater actually reached out and talked about doing something with Washburn. And I said, well, if you want to send an N2, uh, I'll do a comparison into N4. And, um, but they said they didn't have any N2s to, to loan me. So we didn't do the video. Um, so there you go. That's, that's what that N4 is. So how old is uh, my green one? It's like I said, 2000. Eight nine ish. You'd have to look up when the tattoo guitar came out. Does it say? Oh, you know what's cool? It says there was only fifty made. Oh, for the Japanese market. <laughs> so there you go. So there you go. And like I said, mine. Uh, I still have the letter. Mine came with a letter that basically said it was in the president of Washburn's office, and it was his personal one. And they were selling. And it says that it that's actually says in the letter they're selling it to to raise funds money to for the company because you know it was the economy was just tanked. All right, uh, so there you go. That's uh, that's it. Let's go to let's go to uh, Dale. Dale says, Phil, do you think Fender will ever make an acoustasonic bass model like the Tele Strat, but for a bass? You know that I'd actually be more interested in than their Strat acoustic guitar. Um, so uh, so you know Dale. Um, let me show you. Um, go go Dan. Godan Guitars um, makes a uh, amazing acoustic electric guitar called the A6 that I absolutely love, and I like it more than the Fender one. Um, but they actually make a bass version of that, and I say bass version, um, and it's called the A4 and the A5 or a five-string. Let me show you one of those. Here you go. And I'm pulling it up right now to share with you guys. This is it. So Godin makes a bass that's kind of in that vein, right? It does the acoustic thing. It's got transducer pickup underneath the saddles here. It's got an actual soap bar pickup. It's got all these electronics. You can get it in a four string or a five string. It's got a big thumb rest right there because um, obviously they don't think you're going to do a lot of slapping on that on that bass. Um, but it's a very cool, cool bass. Um, I've never owned one, but I've played a bunch because we would carry them in the store. And um, I, I love it. And uh, personally, I don't know. What are they going for nowadays? Let's see what's... That's $2,300. Woo! That's kind of... Pre well, that's the five string. So 2000 bucks Used, it looks like they're around $1,500. Way more than I remember them being. But either way, uh, and you can see... I see one here for $17. Um, but uh, so yeah, would Fender do that? They might. You know, Fender is an odd duck. Um uh, funny, funny, f funny, uh, s story, uh, with Fender is, you know, I once was talking to the head of, of the product manager for the base division at Fender. Um, and, uh, I was giving him crap because I said, you know, why can't Fender make a good five string base? <laughs> you know, I, I mean, for those that, that have a Fender five string bass and like them, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really happy for you. Ralph has a five string, uh, ja jazz, uh, bass. What artist? Victor Bailey. I think it's a Victor Bailey bass. That's awesome. But I say awesome. I mean, the bass is overall awesome. I've just never been a fan of their low B string on the Fender basses. I don't know why, uh, uh, Lakeland and, uh, Sadowski and all those guys seem to be able to produce a bass that looks exactly like the Fender one, where to me, the low B is tighter and punchier. Now, some of them are using a 35 inch scale instead of 34, but some of them are using the standard 34 scale. So I'm like, why doesn't Fender? So I asked him, why doesn't Fender make a great Great five string bass. I go, it just doesn't. I ne I've every five string Fender bass I've ever had, I've never kept. And he's like, yeah, you know, I, I don't know. He goes, it, he goes, you're preaching, you're, you know, you're preaching to the choir here. He goes, the problem is, and this is what he said. He goes, the problem is, the problem is, is when I talk to my boss, our bosses, he said bosses, when I talk to my bosses about, you know, making and improving new bass stuff, all they hear is, wah, 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 when are we going to talk about strats? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you know, even though Fender pretty much owns the bass market, it's still such a small side of the company overall compared to the guitar side of it. Um, and I thought that was really insightful. Um, so the, the answer to your question is, would they, will they make a bass version of that guitar? Um, I'm going to, I'm going to throw a guess. Okay. Here's my guess. The answer is no. Uh, I might be wrong. Maybe they'll do it next year in January and I'll have to eat, you know, egg on my face. But here's why I'm going to say no. Um, 
I think they overmade too many of those acoustic, uh, acoustic guitars uh, during COVID. Um, the designer of it, by the way, I don't think is with Fender anymore. The guy who designed it for Fender. And, um, it's a great design. Like I said, overall, I've always liked the guitar and I really like the guitar as a made in Mexico product more so than made in the USA. Cause I just, you know, I just, I think guitars like that, just like the Go Na6, I think they're really a sweet spot for them is about a thousand bucks or below. You know, I just think that's a really utility type instrument. I feel like that's an instrument that's really made for legitimate gigging musicians. Like I, I know hobbyists buy it too, because hobbyists buy everything. <laughs> We're all buying stuff. But but I mean, I, I think of the acoustic sonic instrument as truly, you know, using it to play at a small, you know, coffee shop or play out or, or you know, it's it's it actually solves a problem, right? Um, the, the thing though, is that realistically, and, and I'm going to just, I'm going to feel like crap saying this out loud. All of my friends that use it in a legitimate way for gigging, got it for free. All of them, every single one of them. Like I think like 10 people I know they use it. So like I said, it's not like they got it for free and then they don't use it. They use it. I see them using it. They're artists that I know. They're YouTubers I know. They use those guitars to gig all the time, but they got them for free. And I would really believe, I really believe that if they had to buy them, they would have bought the Made in Mexico one because as much as they like it, I don't think they want to spend $2,000 for an instrument that you're going to be standing on, you know, outside or, you know, like I said, just dragging around, literally dragging the gigs. So I think it was cool that they did a more affordable version, but they really overplayed that hand. They really made a lot of those. I was even told um, that, you know, towards the end of this, uh, you know, Fender was just sitting on gazillions of them at the American factory and and really had to push them out the door um, and flood the market with them. And in my experience, what happens, and again, this isn't, that's not a because the guitar is not good. Um, you know, there are tons of products in the history of the guitar industry that to me are fantastic products, but they, they died a horrible death because of a miscalculation in, in the purchasing. A perfect example of that is, some of you guys will remember the Crate Power Block. I still have one. Um, you can find them for 100, 150 bucks new, are used right now. Um, what's funny about that is that's what they were new back in the day. If you haven't seen a Crate Power Block, it's a really awesome product. It's essentially a, uh, a one channel uh, power amp that you can use as a keyboard amp because it can go stereo in and stereo out. It can go mono in and mono out and be a guitar amp. It could be a bass amplifier. It has some overdrive. It takes pedals well. Um, it even looks cool. I don't, you know, if you don't like crate, then the big crate logo looks a little silly, but the overall thing looks really cool. And, and it was, it was a great product. The reason why it, you know, before obviously crate shut down, but the reason why it, it died, it's horrible death was crate accidentally overbought. They bought way too many of them and they were just flooded with them. And they, 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 you know, they estimated wrong. That's what happens, especially overseas products and stuff, right? You have to guess what you need for the year. And they, they guessed wrong. They had way too many of them and they had to dump them. And this is why I'm, I'm talking about this particular product is that was the first time I learned this lesson in that, in the industry, which is that if they have to clearance out a product really hard, okay, for a period of time, like they did with the power block and you go, okay, well, are you going to make a new one? Maybe with reverb, make it better. And they're like, there, we feel like the market's ruined because people all remember getting them for dirt cheap. So you can't come back with a power block for $3.99. It's not going to work. I think Fender's kind of the problem with Acoustic Sonic, right? They've been dumping them for a while. Um, I don't know if they're going to want to expand the lineup a whole lot, but I don't know because, again, like the power block, I think it's a great product. So it's it's kind of like this you know, how do you, how do you get, you know, how do you guess on this? You have a product. I think that's overall, it's a good quality product. And then you have a product, that same product, like I said, they've been dumping them price wise. Um, and another reason why, so, you know, it, you guys, we can't just think about us, right? You have to think about the actual retailer. And this is why, <laughs> because the retailer is not emotional like us as a whole. They're not thinking about, oh, the power block was so great. We can't wait for new ones. The retailers are kind of thinking about like, well, I just sold those for nothing. You know, and then when, you know, that company comes back and goes, okay, well, you want to buy more of them for a lot more money? They're like, no, <laughs> because a lot of retailers aren't like Sweetwater and Guitar Center. A lot of retailers are, um, they have like their own baked in customer base. You know, Guitar Center and Sweetwater constantly getting a, a barrage of new customers, fresh blood every day, every week, every month, where a lot of mom and pops, which are, and I'm, 
a lot of mom and pops are big stores. Chuck Levin's, you know, um, there's a lot of big stores throughout the country. They still have a baked in customer base. So they have to kind of sell to the same customer base overall for the, for the most part, like 60% of their sales are to the same people over and over again. So again, they're looking at it like, man, I just blew out all those to those customers. They're not going to pay more for the same thing, even if you change it a little bit. So, but if you can't, if they don't do it, Dale, now, you know, you can get the Godan and uh, it's a high quality instrument. That A5 is is a magnificent instrument. You can even get that instrument fretless if you want. So, and they do a really cool on their fretless. Um, they do it the way I think they should, <laughs> all fretlesses should be. Um, it's a hybrid line fretless. In other words, instead of having the lines uh, either inlaid in or painted on the fretboard, they just have the start of the lines, which is really nice. Kind of gives you a reference of it. So, all right, uh, let's see. Uh, Comcast says, uh, seems like they could offer Acoustasonic kits. I think they should bring the Acoustasonic line oh, to, to the, the Squire side of the, of the business. Why not? You know, could be cool. You know, obviously they seem to have a great desire to level up the Squire line. Um, a Squire as always, in, in my opinion, of course, has always been chasing Epiphone, uh, in the, in the market. Epiphone's always been the leader when it comes to leveling up that brand, right? Epiphone definitely was like, you know, and I'm not talking about old Epiphone before, you know, where it was, where it was high, high end stuff, more high end than Gibson. I'm talking about the Epiphone we know now. Epiphone has been leveling up and consistently for decades where Squire really was chasing that tail. And, um, and, uh, and so, you know, uh, you know, uh, the people who run Squire have said that too, that they, that's something they have to think about, right? They've, they've, Squire was an afterthought for a long time for Fender. Um, the company wasn't really focused on that brand. It was kind of like, hey, this is our student grade stuff. And it wasn't, in my opinion, it wasn't until Epiphone said, hey, here's a quality instrument just made overseas that Squire was like, wow, <laughs> take notice. And, uh, you know, uh, and it takes a lot to level up that brand, as you guys know, especially in this market where it's like, you know, you have Harley Benton and all these off brand stuff and every brand you constantly find on Amazon, that's good quality stuff. And it's rocket dirt cheap. <laughs> I don't know why I said rocket dirt cheap. It's like a rocket to the bottom dirt cheap, it's super dirt cheap. Um, so, uh, I think, uh, Acoustic Sonic moving to the Squire side would definitely level up the Squire vibe, right? Because again, it's a very, like to me, if you could get it made in Squire for $4.99, $5.99, that'd be cool, right? I'd, I, I'd dig it for that. I'd be, I'd use it. It's a really cool instrument. Like I said, to me, some instruments, some products are more, you know, util, for utility purposes. In other words, the Acoustasonic isn't something you collect. It's something you use. And because you use it, if you can make a good quality one for a better price, it's just going to be more accessible to two working musicians who I think are buying those. Yeah, Brent says acoustic Squire Acoustic Sonic would be probably the perfect price point as long as they didn't make an, an expensive one. Well, it would be an expensive one. Brent, I agree with you. Obviously, we're seeing eye to eye on this, but I, I'm telling you, it would be an expensive. I think it would be the most expensive Squire they've ever done. Um, you know, maybe even seven ninety nine. But you gotta understand, it would be a far cry from what they're, you know, what the, <laughs> the USA ones and even the made Mexico ones have been going for. They would bring it down a little bit, but I mean. My guess is, um, you know, it was, it's just going to be, it's going to be more because of, because there's two factors going on. First of all, even though it's a really kind of a CNC acoustic, anything acoustic means more handwork. <laughs> hollow body guitars. I've said this for, for years. So you guys know, just so you guys realize hollow body guitars and acoustic guitars fall in the same category. It's why so many companies like Paul Reed Smith is a perfect example where they'll make their guitars in Indonesia or they'll make their guitars, the electric guitars in Indonesia or of course back in the day, Korea, right? But uh, Paul Reed Smith guitars makes their acoustics in China and they make their hollow bodies in China. And the reason is, is because China manufacturing likes to throw bodies at the problem, right? They like to literally put hands on things instead of machinery. They have a lot of people. And so they want to employ lots of people. If you haven't seen, um, you know, some, some of the, the way that China kind of comes at the problem when it comes to manufacturing, where the, 
Indonesia, Korea, uh, they are more like the United States where they're throwing more machines at the thing, right? So the machine's gonna do a lot of the work. Acoustics are really hard to do with machines. It's still hand labor intensive. That's why a $99 acoustic can still be considered handmade. It's just because the CNC cuts out the parts and then somebody has to glue them together, put them in the jigs, you know, okay? So hollow bodies really fall in the same thing. The Acoustasonic would be less like that, but still like that. So I'm my guess is they would take that to China. And then of course, you know, uh, because of that, they would still have to, the pricing would still be higher than if it was machined out and slapped out very quickly. So that's that's my thought process on that. But like I said, I think to the end result to the working musician who is uh, trying to <laughs> trying to pay the bills with the cut that they get at the end of the night, you know, it's nice to have an instrument that's quality that's not uh, that doesn't freak you out. Um, a lot of you guys, you know, a lot of different people here in the show watching the show. Some of you are hobbyists, some of you are professionals, some of you are in the industry. Um, but when I say working musicians, um, I don't mean that you have a band and you play out on the weekend and it's, it's really fun for you. I mean, I, I consider you a, a legitimate musician. Um, however, when I say working, I mean, I have friends that literally that's, they don't have a day job. They, they play music for a living and, um, you know, they make a good amount of money, <laughs> you know, but not a lot of money. And they literally have to look at instruments like any other trade of is this cost. It's a cost system to them. And also they have to take gigs in all kinds of places because um, that's how it works. And when you take gigs everywhere in all parts of town, you don't want a lot of gear sitting in a car. You know, it's it's financially, you don't want to be in a situation where you go and you make $300 for the night and somebody steals $3,000 worth of crap out of your car. I, I mean, it's not even the emotional, you know, stress of that and how, you know, how most you could relate to like how horrible it would feel to have $3,000 worth of stuff. I mean, think about that. I mean, it's 10 more gigs. You got to work for 10 more gigs to buy the crap you just lost. I mean, that would be, it's, it's so financially devastating as well. So they're usually looking for um, more practical instruments, instruments that keep the price down that actually do the job. So that's why I said it would be an, in, it would be an instrument um, that would do well. I think so. Okay. Um, okay. Brent says 799 would be a great for an Acoustasonic. I was thinking expensive being 999 or more. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. And trust me in a perfect world, I'd say 599, right? Cause that to me is a, a, a sweet, a really sweet um, price point for an instrument like that. Cause like I said, it will, it, you know, really be competitive against Godan and stuff. So, uh, Rock J says too many Chinese guitars though. You know, I don't disagree. <laughs> you know, I, I don't disagree. The reality though of the world is, you know, some things you're going to, it's what you're focused on. If you're focused on the price point, then, you know, that's where you're going to go. You know, Vietnam, China, India, that's where you're getting those prices down. If that's the focus point, you know, and again, everybody has a different reason for doing what they want. Like I've always said, and I will continue to say forever, 340 episodes today, uh, 340 episodes buying American-made guitars, Japan, Japanese-made guitars, German-made guitars, you name it, I'm, you know, is a luxury. And if you can afford to do that, then I'm, I, you should be, you know, excited, happy for yourself, right? It's a luxury, though. That's a luxury price to pay um, for those instruments. And like I said, um, if you ask me, like, should people buy those? Well, I always say people should buy whatever fits their needs uh, and their personal thing. I'm not here to tell you guys what to do. Um, but I will tell you that it is a luxury. So it's hard to tell people like, you know, <laughs> yeah, always buy a $3,000 guitar. So um, always buy a $2,000 guitar. It's a tough thing to say. It's a tough thing. But I agree with you. I, I Like most people, I'm really not excited about, you know, engaging in the, uh, you know, strip mine economy li logic. But realistically, some people are just, you know, that's where their prices fall, you know, that fit their needs. And also, like I just said, I, I'd be, you know, I would be 
remiss if I didn't say to you guys that I'm not even talking about people who are just, I'm not talking about chintzy cheap people like, oh, I'm just gonna not pay any money for guitar. I'm like I said, I see real musicians with real problems. They're like, look, I, I just can't buy this kind of guitar. Not because I can't afford it. Cause that's one thing I always hear. I'm going on a tangent. I apologize. But one comment I hear from people who sometimes don't have never interacted with as many musicians as I have will say something like, um, you know, why don't they save up and buy a better guitar? I've just explained to you that there are some musicians where the price isn't the there because of their limitations, right? It's not that they can't afford a better guitar. It's just they don't need to spend, you know, right? They don't need to spend an insane amount of money on an instrument um, because, like I said, it can get stolen. It's they're going to wear it out anyways. You know, um, there's a guy uh, who's well known in the in the state of Arizona where I live. His name's Chucky Baby and Chucky Baby and the All Stars. And this guy is like a dude. He's one of the hardest gigging guys I've known. Um, you know, it would be not uncommon for Chuck to play 60 gigs. I'm not exaggerating. 40 gigs, 60 gigs a month. That's not a gig a day. That's two gigs a day, right? Uh, you know, play the casino during the day, go play the hotel gig at night. The next day he's at a bar. The next day he's at a wedding, you know? Um, and I, I always use him as a reference to this because one, he was a hardworking guy, but he would always come in the store. Obviously I would do some work for him, you know, repair work and stuff. Cause he could just, he just wear stuff out. You can't gig like that. And and wear stuff out. And a lot of people would say like, well, he needs stainless steel frets and he needs a quality instrument. And I'm telling you, he would wear through that stuff. I, 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 I've, I've, you know, me and tons of other guitar techs across the valley. Cause you know, he's just wherever, you know, he's, he was always about supporting mom and pop businesses and wherever he could go. And just hit, you couldn't, you couldn't solve this guy's problem, which is he's just a machine. He's working all the time. He's wearing stuff out, stuff wears out. So he would f have to find instruments that would take a good amount of abuse that was uh, relatively ex inexpensive to replace or fix, or in his case, actually to give him credit, fix, 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 replace, right? I mean, he would fix, you know, he would wear his instruments down. We would, we would fix them, fix them, fix them. And then at some point it was like, nope, it's time to pass that one on and go to the next one. So in his case, you know, uh, it's not never because he couldn't afford a better instrument. Um, in fact, he would buy nicer instruments, you know, to have around his house for fun, you know, because he's, he's a guitar fanatic like all of us. But he's like, you know, like I said, leaving it in the back of the Suburban, you know, uh, uh, those of you who haven't gigged a, a lot in your life, maybe to understand that literally, um, it's why I'm not a fan of cases, guitar cases. Um, it's because when people came into my store, I'm traumatized from it. So, you know, um, I don't use guitar cases because every every time somebody came into the store to buy a guitar because a guitar got stolen, they're like, yeah, my guitar got stolen. I'm buying a new guitar today. I'm like, um, sucks. And they always say the same thing. They always say the same thing in a band environment. Okay. And, or, and that counts churches too. It happens at churches for, which is crazy to me, but it's always the same story. They, somebody was supposed to watch it and didn't. Okay. It was left into a, a vehicle and of course they got out of the vehicle or left in a spot or left in a back room of a, of a place and it got taken or it was sitting on the ground and they turned around and it was gone. And so I, from that only use gig bags. I don't go wherever I go, I go gig bags. And I can tell you right now, if you've ever seen me at a, at a, any gig or any time I'm playing with any musicians that my instrument is on my shoulder, like a, like a woman with her purse. Like I'm holding it the whole time. If I go over to the bar to get a beer, I'm like, I'm drinking my beer. I'm holding my, my base. Like I literally it's, it's here with looped in. Like it's, it's exactly, I know exactly where it is all the time. And it's because of that. And so again, I'm not saying not to get cases. I'm just explaining you why I do the things I do. So again, those are things you have to factor into the price of instruments that are important, <laughs> right? Like I said, there are some instruments you just, just if they got stolen, it would be traumatic financially and um, probably emotionally too. Uh, Shiznit says, never leave your instrument. I can tell you, man, that is the best advice. Never for a second, leave an instrument. I was told, I don't know if this is true, but I was told this many times. I never thought to ask the man himself, but uh, I was told this many times. If you've ever seen a Paul Reed Smith core guitar, which is why it's interesting because the gig bags, which the SEs come in, is not the same and neither are the gig bags come with the S2s. But Paul Reese with guitars do not say PRS on the case. They all come with a sticker. You can stick a, a PRS sticker on the case, but no Paul Reed Smith core guitar 
has the name PRS or Paul Reed Smith on the case itself. And I asked once, I go, because that's kind of weird, because, you know, companies like that, especially high-end companies, put the name, you know, Gibson, Fender, you know, Fender's in Boston, the plastic. And they said it's because if you if somebody sees a guitar with PRS on the case, that's a guitar to steal. Uh, and I think it was because that that was how they did it when they started out. And, and they said they all said uh, and have talked to many people at PRS in the marketing side, in the sales side, who all kind of hold true to the story. Um, but I've never asked Paul Reed Smith himself. So maybe if you guys ever see him on some of these out there about maybe ask him about it. But they said it's because um, and it's why, by the way, if you get a PRS box, it always just says fragile and it doesn't say PRS in the box. Same reason. They don't want to advertise that this is a three thousand dollar guitar because that's. You know, people, you know, even musicians who are barely in the game know Gibson, PRS, right? I mean, it's not hard to figure out what you should steal. You don't have to be very educated to know, you know, I don't know what Harley Benton is. <laughs> I'm not stealing that, but you know, steal PRS, steal a, uh, you know, a Gibson, steal a Fender. Those are, those are guitars to steal. So that's why uh, they don't put it on the case. So... So Shane says, that's why you should buy AliExpress chips and his decoys. <laughs> it's interesting. That's a funny thought. You know, I would love, you guys were, uh, they were talking about this on the Patreon show about next year doing more interview shows. And the idea would be to do them on a Friday where we never did them on Friday, but do a half show. In other words, an hour like this and an hour with a guest. And uh, and uh, uh, so I'm, I'm working on that. But you know who I would love to interview? And if you guys know anybody uh, that would be a good candidate. Send it to me or send them to me. As a, uh, but I would love to interview somebody at a pawn shop. I have never worked at a pawn shop. I've, I really barely even bought anything from pawn shops. Uh, to be honest, my experience with pawn shops uh, in my youth was always in the worst direction. Like I was selling something because I was broke as crap. I even uh, pawned my truck once. Uh, yeah, you know, sometimes you just got to make the bills, right? Um, and so, <laughs> you know, if you haven't have, so I think maybe I'm traumatized from that. Like I never saw pawn shops as where to get good deals. I saw pawn shops as like, you know, I gotta go make my payment and get my stuff back. So, um, but I would love to interview somebody at a pawn shop because I wonder, I'd wonder if there's stories like that. Somebody stole a Gibson thinking that's the thing to steal. And then they go into the pawn shop and it's a Chipson. Uh, it'd be kind of funny to see that reaction. Wouldn't it be funny to see somebody who thought they stole the $3,000 guitar? Um, and, and they're like, yeah, this is not a real one. You stole a fake one. <laughs> so who knows? Um, let's see. Uh, uh, all right, uh, let's go ahead. Uh, let me grab this. Uh, let's see, Amanda sent this to me. Uh, she said she sent this from Michael, who says, if you ever bought a Warmoth neck, is it normal to have the adjust the nut and do a level crown on a new Warmoth neck set up okay? Um, I have installed uh, dozens and dozens of Warmoth necks over the years for customers, and currently I have a Warmoth neck on one of my guitars. My Somnium Tele guitar, uh, which I'm going to put the Somnium logo on the body. Uh, if you guys notice, like uh, somebody, no one asked, which is funny. But at one, one time, if you noticed in the last couple of videos, the headstock is now black and it doesn't say Somnium on it. It's because I switched the necks to a um, a warm-up neck. Uh, so the warm-up neck that's on the Somnium guitar now is is more to my liking. It has a stainless steel frets. It has uh, uh, it has uh, rosewood. The other one's rosewood. Um, but the neck carve is a little different, a little, little different. And um, so I bought a warm off neck and put it on there. Um, what I had to do with that, Michael, on that neck was pretty consistent what I've seen with most warm off necks. Um, a little bit of uh, adjustment to the nut, right? And uh, uh, put a nut in and, and, or actually I ordered that with a nut already on it, but I had to cut the slots a little bit better for the nut because I think they just give you the basic slot cuts. And then I had to... Adjust the neck, of course, let it settle. Um, and then uh, I did not, I do not do any uh, on the warm mouth necks. I never do uh, crown uh, levels, level and crowns, all that stuff right away. I always kind of put it on the guitar, set the guitar up, get a feel for it, let the neck settle, let the guitar kind of, you know, it's almost like let the body and neck understand that they're now <laughs> together, <laughs> right? Uh, and then and then make it justice. I think on the guitar, I maybe have leveled one or two frets and spot, you know, spot leveled and stuff. Um, but it was probably one of the best warm up necks I've ever gotten. And I've always liked them. Uh, 
And I kind of wonder if Warmoth necks are a little bit better if you do stainless steel frets, because a lot of manufacturers I've noticed that do stainless steel frets will put more time into making them perfect. I think it's because they know it's a little harder aftermarket. I don't know. But uh, no, I didn't have to do a whole lot. Had to cut the nut slots, had to make some adjustments to the neck. But uh, other than that, I don't think I had to do much. Um, and I rounded the fret ends. I rounded them off. They weren't sprouted, but obviously they just weren't as smooth as I liked. So I rounded them off. Uh, okay. Uh, Steve says, hey, Phil, do you think there are too many Chinese made guitars, but too many badly made guitars? Well, okay. <laughs> Hold on. I'll get to it. Uh, no reason nowadays for that. People have no reason to buy without knowledge. Buy only decent made. Um, well, the problem is most people are now buying, they don't know, right? You're just kind of guessing, you know, you guess the guitar. Like I said, we live in a, uh, you buy before you try environment. Um, people constantly tell me all the time, like, you know, I, I don't buy guitars online, I only buy them in person. There's nothing wrong with that. That's the smartest way to buy them. There's there's no fault in that logic. Um, uh, I can do hours of research. Look, it, 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 I've done it a million times. You guys done it a million times as just a guitar fanatic. Uh, I've read every uh, video, I read every spec, I read every review, I watch 10 YouTube videos, I pull the trigger and I buy the guitar and I get it, and here's the irony. It takes me 30 seconds to know if I like it or not. <laughs> I walk in music stores sometimes and I, I almost kind of sob inside because sometimes when I go into music stores and I see that dream piece of gear that I go, oh man, I've been wanting that, and I grab it and I go, oh, nope. And I go, 10 seconds. It took me 10 seconds to know I didn't like it. And the sad thing is that online, it would have took me 10 hours of research to find out that I might not like it. And uh, so, no, playing stuff, touching it, of course, is the best. The problem is, is that you have two opposing issues. You have this infinity of choice that is so amazing. Um, you know, before the internet, I don't remember wanting things other than what I saw in ads and guitar world and stuff. You'd see, you know, guitars that you, you know, dream about, but that's not how it worked for me. I just remember I walked in a music store and I wanted a guitar and they had red or black and purple and a green one. And I was like, Oh, okay, that one. And that's how I did it. I didn't go like, Oh man, they don't have the color I want. I'm going to wait, <laughs> you know, maybe hit a couple stores, but it, most of the time, you know, you just, you chose from the selection that was given to you. And you just went, now I find I shop the way a lot of people shop. And it's not even about guitars. I shop that way uh, for anything when I'm in a store. I go and I look and they don't have exactly what I want. And I go, that's probably online. <laughs> and then you start calculating because you rather have exactly what you want, the color and stuff. So Steve, I think you're you're right. Is there too many, you know, cheaply made guitars? That's how I want to kind of take that. Sure, of course. There's a lot. There's an abundance of that. And, and that's why I spend so much of my time on my channel, even when I'm doing a review, whether or not it's like a repair video, it's just a review video. I'm like, here's the problem. Here's how you fix it. I, I get some backlash for that. I actually get more backlash than I think I, sh I can I understand. They'll go, you know, people go, why would you fix that? And, and like, why don't you just, you know, right. And I go, well, I'm fixing it for you guys. I mean, I'm like, you know, cause I'm, I'm assuming not everybody got it. I mean, assuming if you got it and it, you've had it for 13 minutes and you want to return it, you just return it. But I'm, I'm thinking sometimes you bought it used or sometimes you've, you've had it and the problem started after the return cycle, or maybe you really, really like the guitar. I've had, I've had issues where I really like a guitar so much, but it's got an issue. And I, man, if I could just fix that issue, I don't want to take the chance. Um, I don't, I don't, almost don't trust a guitar player <laughs> if they don't relate to this comment I'm about to say, which is, you know, I've had a guitar where I'm like, okay, it needs to go back, but it's 90% there and where it's, where it's kicking ass. I don't want to take the chance that the next one doesn't have the mojo that this is having in the plot spots it's having. So if I can fix the thing and go, then I, I want to do that. Um, and so, you know, so you, you make these mental compromises and stuff. So, I, I think to your core, your question is, are too many cheap guitars, too many junky guitars being made out there? Sure, of course. But, you know, I mean, I try not to get in that in that mindset. Yeah, to me, you can go in the dollar store and make yourself nuts with all the crap people, you know. Um, I had a friend once. Uh, I still have that friend, actually. So I should say, I, I, I have a friend. I have a friend who, his name's Chris. And, uh, and uh, so if he's watching, because sometimes he does watch the show, sometimes. Uh, anyways, and he 
said this thing that I loved. He says, you know, not that he's pro government and pro taxes. You know, I mean, no one is, right? Uh, he said sometimes he wishes, and I thought it was a great idea, that companies would have to have like a landfill tax, right? And the landfill tax, and again, it's not to, you know, make everything more expensive, but the idea would be that, you know how like a company gets a safety rating and they, they show like, hey, this product has been tested. It's almost like, wouldn't it be kind of cool if they made a product and it would have to be tested and the test is to see how long it lasts. And the, the so if it does, so basically, and how fast does this end up in the landfills? Based on the question, right? So if they make something that lasts 10 years, then they pay a, you know, like a 1% tax or whatever, right? And if they make something that looks like it's going to fall apart in nine days, then that gets like a 70% tax. So almost like there's no benefit to them to make crap, right? I'm sure it would all get screwed up and in every, you know, as all government things do. But I just love the idea of, wouldn't it be interesting if companies were somehow accountable for making crap, right? They make something that doesn't last. It it has to you know it they have to pay more to do it right almost like pay the landfills and you know maybe they should pay for the trash we're throwing away you know because they're the reason we're throwing it away it doesn't last I think about that especially nowadays and I want to go too on a far tangent but you know I I'm now in the last ten years of my life have bought refixed uh, more importantly fixed and then had to buy two new refrigerators in 10 years In 10 years i bought a refrigerator i paid uh 300 to fix it the first time like 200 to fix it the second time and then it had to go it just died again and i was like i'm done get a new refrigerator same thing paid 500 to fix that one and what let, makes me laugh is in 10 years i've gone through two refrigerator refrigerators refrigerators i don't know refrigerators refrigerators i probably went 30 years in my life I don't remember replacing any refrigerators. <laughs> I remember you just got sick of it one day, right? Your first refrigerator was like 30 years old. I remember the first one you get is like you buy a used one in the paper for a hundred bucks. It was 30 years old. And then you keep that until you can afford a nice one. And then you buy a nice one. And then if you ever need another one, you sell that one off. Like you just didn't buy refrigerators. And um, and now all the stuff, uh, my wife has actually gotten so fed up with, uh, washers and dryers that now she will only buy like a more basic washer and dryer because we bought expensive ones and they break and then, you know, and so same thing, everything's just crap. So to answer your question, very long winded ways. Um, yeah, I mean, but junk is everywhere. So that's why, that's where I hope the value of stuff like this is. You know, these discussions, videos, you know, showing you guys like these are the components. These are the issues I see. This is the thing, um, especially the guitar, you know, um, you know, that's why I did a video. Like I said, I have people will dog Glary's all the time, which is fine because there's 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 a lot to dog there. But like I said, I took a Glary and I turned it into a professional instrument. It is fine. I can tell you right now, it's fine. It's still fine. It's still going to play. It's going to play forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And um, and uh, why would you do that? I don't know why. <laughs> I think because they made the guitar. And like I said in the video, somebody said you should just throw it right to the trash. And I thought, well, that's the last thing I want to do with something when I first get it, is throw it right away. Um, so Michael says, third fridge and stove in 16 years. Yeah. See, it's weird. So... It's it, so like I said, I don't want to get into the too much in that discussion, man. That gets everybody in the, you know, let's focus on the fun stuff. Okay. So, uh, let me, let me jump around real quick. Um, this one I got, uh, I saw the question. Amanda sent me one from somebody named, Oh, <laughs> it's a bunch of O's or a bunch of zeros. Um, pretty sure the O's, but I saw, uh, unfrequently people ask this question too. What interface do I use? So I use, uh, four interfaces basically for different scenarios. So let me tell you the scenarios. So obviously for this podcast, I'm using the Mackie DLZ, uh, which is why the know your gear podcast. I can trigger things like that. Um, and so this is great. Uh, when I do the bonus podcast with my wife and, uh, you know, cause I can add multiple mics to it. So I'm using the DLZ for this podcast. Um, for most of the videos that you guys see, I would say 90%, nine out of 10. And I actually probably more than that, but let's just say nine out of 10 videos that you guys see, I'm using the Neve, uh, 88 uh, M interface. It's very expensive. It's like 11, 1200 bucks, but it is an amazing interface. Um, so 
absolutely love that. Uh, to me, it makes my life easy. Everything I plug into it, uh, it just it just sounds good. And it's really dumbed down and I can use it on whatever computer because I have two rooms and two computers and it doesn't take, uh, uh, it doesn't need a power supply or anything. I can just plug it in USB into the computer and go. Um, now, if I'm doing sometimes, I'm not, instead of using that, which is why I highly recommend this, uh, is I will use this. Uh, this is the uh, Volt 2 by UA Audio. Um, somebody told me that UA is going to start charging you some kind of service plan or something. I don't know much about that, but I use this and it works fine. <laughs> so, uh, this thing's like 150 bucks retail. And, um, it's in my opinion, uh, which is when I did the video on the uh, 88M, uh, I said it in that video too. This is like 80% of the way there. Like, uh, you know, it's, it's 10% the price. <laughs> 80% the sound. So, uh, so there you go. So, uh, you know, for those uh, out there, this is, I like this better than the Scarlet stuff. I, on all those other interfaces. This is the one I like, but to me, it's not about just getting in your computer. It's the sound it generates. This is what I like. And I like this. Um, and then the other interface I will use is a zoom H six, um, which is in the other room. Uh, and the zoom H six, you sometimes see me in videos I'm using as a microphone recording with it, but sometimes, uh, I'll use it. I'll just plug in and run USB into a computer, especially a laptop. And I'll use that as an interface too. Those are the, uh, four interfaces, uh, systems I've used. I've used other stuff, of course, uh, throughout the years, but that's the stuff I've been using very consistently, uh, in the recent year or two in the last couple of years. So that's where you see me do this stuff. Um, but, uh, but yeah, the my absolute favorite sounding is the is the Neve uh, 88M. But like I said, it comes with a huge price tag. I can justify that because uh, I'm an idiot. <laughs> no, I can justify it because of course I'm making content, you know. And so you're like, okay, this is to to make better quality content, and it makes my workflow better. I'm really about the workflow more than anything else. How fast can I do something? Um, so there you go. So there you go. Um, let's see. Um, and like I said, I've tried all the interfaces and, you know, as far as I'm concerned, all the interfaces are pretty good. However, um, when I switched to the UA one, I thought I, I thought I heard a huge improvement. Um, somebody says the Volt 2 latency. I don't understand. So the latency thing, so you don't understand the way I use interfaces, latency is not a thing for me. <laughs> because I'm just recording straight in and I'm not, I don't hear, I'm not listening back to it. So it's not like recording for music, music. I'm recording for YouTube content and it doesn't really work that way. And yes, the UA has a built-in compressor, which is really nice. It's a really cool feature. Like I said, this again, the reason I like the UA stuff, I just gotta tell you this again, um, this unit, and there's one smaller than this too, but might as well have the two interface has a built-in compressor, but more importantly, this, um, can run off power, but I do not use power. It runs off the USB just into my laptop. And so again, this is a workflow thing. I don't need to worry about where the wall ward is, the plug is, all that stuff. Just plug this in. This is my interface. I go right to my computer. Um, the Neve does the same thing. It's pretty easy. Uh, the DLZ Mackie does have a power supply and it's a little bit more intricate, but of course, um, you know, it, it has triggers and stuff and it has other things that I can do with it. So there you, there you go. Um, and, um, I don't know. <laughs> so, okay. Um, somebody says, uh, Shiznit says the Presonus didn't cut it anymore. No, Presonus is in the uh, box. The Presonus, I still like, so, you know, I talked about that. Um, the, I did not get rid of the Presonus. I still have it. I'm just not using it. And the reason I'm not using it is, uh, is that my wife worked out a deal with Mackie to supply the Mackie DLZ and, and the microphones and stands and stuff. So I was like, oh, okay, cool. And we give it a try. And obviously I like it because it's got features. To me, the the Mackie DLZ is definitely a podcaster thing, right? Um, I like the DLZ. I also would recommend um, the, um, uh, what's the other one? Road, R-O-D-E, the Road uh, podcasting unit. Um, so it's just more of a, like I said, better use for podcasting. Um, the personas I was using as my podcasting and as an interface for, you know, all, my guitar and all that stuff. And it worked fine. It was good. It's just, like I said, um, once I went to the Neve, I just, it just massively changed everything for me. Uh, it just sounds so good. It sounds better to me every time I, I play it sounds. And, and when I say better, I mean, for what I'm doing, which is different than recording 
music songs, it's accuracy. It's, I want you to feel like you're in the room with me. I want you to think, I want you to hear a product the way I'm hearing a product. That's a totally different thing than what a recording engineer is doing. A recording engineer is uh, recording, people record that stuff are trying to make things sound really good. I'm not trying to make it sound good. I'm trying to make it sound exactly how it sounds. And uh, I put a lot of work and effort over the years. In fact, at detriment, I'm probably actually worse at, at recording stuff to make it sound good and better at just recording you know, to, to make it sound like it is in the room. Um, a lot of people ask me, like, I have an aux and I have the, 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 uh, two note stuff. And they're like, how come you don't use that in, uh, you know, when I'm doing review videos and it's because I think that stuff sounds too good. So if you want an endorsement for the aux or the two note stuff, I think that if <laughs> you are watching a video and they're using an aux or two notes and you go, that sounds good. That's that aux sounding good. <laughs> that thing sounds good. I really think it sounds better. Uh, and again, I'm not trying to find anything to improve the sound of, of a product I'm checking out because, uh, you know, I don't want, I don't want to hear you go, I bought it and it doesn't sound anything like it sounded when you had it. I I'm hoping it's going to be like, yeah, that's basically what, you know, this, I set the expectation at what it is. Okay. I went on a tie right now too long about that. Um, okay. Uh, okay, hold on. Okay, let's, uh, let's jump, let's jump over real quick and do some. Okay, so I got, I want to hit some super chats. I'll come back and do some other questions on the, on the thing, but I'm stacking up some super chats here and let's take care of these. Uh, DWC says, Hey, Phil, I'm doing a tele build. What two things do you look for when trying to match pickups? Uh, as a not sold as a set. So one of the ways I really think about tele pickups the most is um, you have to decide in my, in my experience with pickups in the Telecaster guitar, you really want to fall into one of two camps. Okay. Uh, camp one is you want the bridge pickup to be huge and the neck pickup to drop dramatically. So like you get that tele pickup and there's a little bit of a, you know, a big sound. All the tele pickups are going to be like that. The bridge pickups are just, they're going to sound big. And when I say big, don't think bassy. I mean, big, they're in your face. All right. There's no subtle bridge pickup in a tele every, every. So if you like that, great. If you don't like it, it's like, it's like, imagine you hate the sound of somebody's voice and they're just now through a megaphone. That's a tele pickup. And if you love someone's voice, imagine it through a megaphone. It's louder, right? So tele pickup, bridge pickup is going to be, it's going to be there. The neck pickup is a different animal. It usually, like, I always think of like guitars like the Richie Cotts and Tele, where it's like, man, if you have overdrive on the bridge pickup of that guitar and you're playing it, and I know that's a, a blade humbucker tele pickup, but still just go with me. You'll have a sound, it's huge. You go to the neck and it just thins down and it cleans up. And if you're in that camp that that's what you want, you want this dramatic difference in these two pickups so that you have this big, big uh, bridge and a smaller, lighter neck, again, that cleans up the distortion or when you're playing clean, it's gonna sound a little like thinner, but not in a bad way, just like I said, not so in your face. And then the middle being a mix of that, that um, you wanna decide that. What's great about that is that's gonna be most Telecaster pickup sets. Or I know you said not set, but just Telecaster pickups, just, that's how they're going to work. That's, that's how they were made to work. Where it gets a little difficult is if you don't want that. If you want the bridge to not be the star, kind of the big big star of the show, you want your neck pickup to kind of bring as much to the to the party as the bridge. Um, that's why sometimes I like a P90 in the neck of a Telecaster, a mini humbucker in the neck of a Telecaster, um, or... Uh, you know, something a little bigger, bigger sounding than this traditional uh, tele pickup. So um, that's, that's where you kind of really want to, to focus that. Um, there is a ton of uh, pickups on the, on the market, but when you're matching up, you want to think about that. You want to think about, do you want, what scenario are you looking for? And that's how you do it. Um, the, I don't think you have to go with match sets and Telecaster to, to achieve that. In fact, very rarely do I ever have a match set uh, in a Telecaster. It's not, um, it's not always the case with me, but uh, so there you go. That, I mean, that's what I would do. Like I said, I, 
I like having a Tele neck pickup. I just thought something about having that vibe and, and I love it. But man, in a perfect world, like if I was limited to one guitar and it was like how to be a Telecaster style guitar, like if I only have one guitar and you said it had to be a Tele, mine without a doubt for me would be a Tele bridge pickup with a P90 in the neck. And that's how I would do my Tele. <laughs> so, um, because I, I, that's the, I could do everything with that combination for sure. Um, Antique Rocker says jam bands that play from a static list uh, or acts with fully scripted shows, uh, possibly with dancers. <laughs> okay. Uh, what is your preference? Um, that would be a mood thing. So it depends what my mood is. I'm not a huge jam band kind of person. Um, you know, I, 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 I want to be, but I, I can't. Um, so bands that notoriously are known for being big jam bands like Fish or, or Rush, um, to name a few, uh, I don't go see them. Uh, I love Rush. I love Fish, uh, right? I, I love those bands. I have their albums. I listen to them uh, at least every week. But um, I'm not looking for, I, I'm not really into bands where the song I like now is 12 to 20 minutes longer, if you're lucky, in the live version. It's not my favorite thing. Um, so I'm not really big into jam bands. Now, that being said, I am into bands that will sometimes not so much jam the song out longer, but mix it up and play a different vibe of the live version, uh, maybe a different, you know, different tempo, different, different instrumentation, or more importantly, have guests come up on stage and play a different, you know, that's, that's exciting. Right. Um, and I would say the closest thing to a band that I like, that is kind of like a jam band is Bella Fleck and the Flecktones, but I I've seen them four times and I haven't seen them in so many years. I'm not even sure if they tour anymore. Um, but I've seen Bella Fleck and the Flecktones four times with different configurations of the band because they have sometimes they have uh, Howard Levy and then sometimes they have Jeff Coffin, right? Um, and then, so to me, it's not so much I like a, a, a static, more scripted set, you know, polished performance. Um, I think it's a mix of the two. Uh, so, you know, um, I'm not really looking for a band that's going to sound exactly like the album and I'm not looking for a band that's going to basically take liberties for way, way too long for me. Somewhere in the, in the middle of that <laughs> is what I'm looking for. Um, but you know, there you go. I don't hope that answers a little bit. Uh, gas addict says, Hey Phil, I got a Badlands hologram invoice for the full thing a few weeks back. Does that mean it's getting ready to ship? No. Uh, if you got an invoice, uh, my understanding is it means that um, the, my understanding is the first 50 are going to be finished in February. So if you guys have been watching any of the Badlands posts, um, they've been, I, you know, they're showing you where they are, like some body, like they have like, you know, 20, 30 bodies are done, 20, 30 necks are done. They're in line to get this done. And then you got to understand like, um, as what they're doing is um, they're waiting for the parts. So the Godo parts, so you guys know, was it fifty thousand dollars? I'm trying to remember what the check was. It was huge. Um, they, we had to write a huge payment to Godo to buy all the stuff. So we bought all the hardware. So this is why it's important to understand. Godo's takes about six months. And there's guitar builders that watch this channel too, and they're probably screaming at me like, "No, it's like more like eight or nine. It is. But we got them to do it in about six months. So when you put in an order, when we put in an order for a Godo bridge, Godo tuning keys, and and so on, it takes six months for Godo to fill that order. Okay, so we're stuck. However, what we did is we took all of the money that we got for the first 50 paid in fulls and we bought all the hardware for all 100 guitars, right? Because, and and actually that's not just it. We actually also bought all the stuff for all the other hardware, the neck plates. In fact, I think we have a thousand neck plates now or something like that. We took all your money that you gave us for the, for the and that was our profit. This is the important part. The thing that was like, we were gonna, this is our dividend. We paid this to each other as, you know, as the, as the ownership. We took that money and we put it in uh, because here's why. It means that the second batch moves faster than the first batch because they're, they're, we're basically, they're staging the guitars in, because it doesn't matter. Like if all 50 guitars were done today, it wouldn't matter because as you guys know, we did the order in August. So it's September, November, December, January, February, 
See, five months. So we're getting the hardware because I know it's coming around January, February. That's why I think is when the hardware gets here. And then, but once we have that hardware, we now have the hardware for the next 50. We have all the components for the next 50. So then it moves at a much faster rate. Um, and just like the people who, and so you gotta understand when you're being invoiced in full, what you're being invoiced for is just like the people who pay, paid in August in full, they're not getting their guitars till February or is it September in full? You get the idea. Um, same as you, you're paying now in, in, in basically in December, and you're getting your guitar in the same time frame. It's going to take a little, but you'll get the second. The second batch will move a little faster than the first because there's no holdup for the hardware. I, I hope that makes sense. So there you go. Yeah, I wish. I wish the, the guitars were already shipped. But like I said, and keep in mind, I like to point out real quick, this is still be done. It's still being done at a rate at at about twenty five percent. Am I making that up? I don't know what I'm trying to say. 25% of the thing, that doesn't make sense what I'm trying to say. A quarter of the time, I don't know what I'm trying to say. Basically, these guitars are still being built just like the first Red Lines at a f the fastest pace I've you can in this market. Like, I don't know anybody who's building a custom, custom level, custom paint, unique guitars like this faster than us. We're doing it the fastest. So it's just... Like I said, it's I understand. So I'm just giving you reference. Some people are like, oh man, five to six months, or you know, like, yeah, I know that's a long time, but try a year to two years. <laughs> that's what it's been taking everybody else. So we're still moving fast and we're still refining the process, but that's what we did. Um Vim69 says, I missed yesterday's hangout, had to work. Uh, will be the real play, uh, replay available. Um, Vim's uh, 69 is a patron and, and the patron mem and the channel members. Uh, we did a three hour hang yesterday with, um, so you guys know I do these kind of more of a uh, behind the scenes thing. So those are, that are interested in a behind the scenes thing. Uh, Vim's, it is, uh, you should be able to click the link and still see it. If you can't, can you please message me and let me know um, through patron or through members, whichever which way you do. And um, and I'll make sure you get the link, but the link's still active, it stays active, it's it's unlisted. So you, ha you, you can't see it unless you have that original link that takes you to it. So there you go. Um, and uh, I kinda, I, 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 a lot of the patrons and the members, uh, you guys said you really liked yesterday's show. I just like to tell you guys, I kinda feel bad about yesterday's show. I kinda feel like I was unloading a lot on you guys about a lot of stuff going on in the industry with me and friends in the industry. And uh, so I just wanna say, uh, if you, most of you enjoyed it, so I'm happy. But also, I wanted to thank you guys because, like I said, it was very therapeutic for me to get some stuff off my chest. <laughs> Litface says, uh, tell us about the Nuno neck joint. Um, so if you don't know, the Nuno Bittencourt neck joint is a five-bolt uh, system. Uh, Stevens cutaway is what it's called. And it um, it comes at it from the side. It's pretty unique. Now, Washburn's done other guitar versions like it um, over the years. But the Nuno one is what prevailed, obviously, and so that they do that. Um, let's uh, let me show you it. The Nuno, of course, I could just go grab the one off the wall, but I really rather court in four. And I'm, I'm trying to get a detailed image so we don't have to hold the neck at an angle. There it is. Okay, here we go. All right, so so you guys know if you haven't seen one yet, it's see how this bolt pattern goes right here, and it's to give you more access here. Now, I think it's cool. <laughs> Do I notice like it has you know the best access of any guitar I've ever played? Uh, not necessarily. Um, I would say that some set neck and some set through uh, necks and even neck throughs seem more better access than that. Um, but I'd say it's one of the best bolt-on neck accesses. It's not the best, but it's one of the best. It's pretty unique and pretty cool. Um, like I said, hopefully I'll do a, a new, the Nuno in four video. So I was thinking about doing it. I don't know. So it's kind of like it's uh, the question is not whether or not I want to do it. It's just how am I going to set it into all the other projects that I'm working on currently. So we'll see. Uh, the Juggernaut says, Phil, I love the show. Do you have any experience with the lawsuit Les Paul or Strats from... Uh, Tokai, Yamaha, uh, Fujijin in the 80s. Wow, hiccups. Excuse me. Um, do I have an experience with them? Well, I've worked on tons of them. Uh, Greco, there's a ton. Uh, Ibanez, right, all these. Um, they're referred to as lawsuit eras. Funny enough, the uh, the guy who actually handled that, uh, Ron Beanstock, the attorney, uh, had told me it was their lawsuit era, again, I'm not an attorney, okay? I'm just telling you what I remember an attorney who was 
part of that. Ron, Ron, Be Ron Beanstalk, if you don't know that he's an attorney in this industry, um, well-known trademark attorney. He's also the attorney who won the case or part of the team that won the case against Fender that makes Telecaster and Strat bodies public domain. So if you guys don't know, uh, uh, that's why anybody can make a Strat or Tele body. It's public domain. So that's how it works. Um, Fender was basically trying to stop a bunch of companies, uh, everybody from Warmoth and so on. Um, I think Sadowski was in that too. A bunch of people from making certain, I think the P-Base, the Strat, the Tele uh, body, and essentially, um, you know, these companies fought back and they hired Ron and some other attorneys, I'm sure, and they, they won the case against Fender because uh, they were saying, hey, look, you know, this is public domain. Now, why that's important is, why is that important? Uh, uh, the, he says, he told me that when I mentioned once, as you did, the lawsuit era guitars, uh, from the seventies, he said there was never a lawsuit. Um, believe it or not, it was a, he goes, there's no, there, so lawsuit is an incorrect statement. Very legalese, right? He said, uh, he said that they, these companies received a cease and desist and they did. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the end of it. So I said, well, to us laymans, I said, and I actually, so, you know, I said this to him. I said, I don't know. To me, if I got a cease and desist, I'd, I would be like that. I would tell my friends, I'm like, I'm being sued. He's like, yeah, well, that's not accurate. And I go, yeah, but that's how I think most people think. Like if you get a letter saying cease and desist, you're thinking from an attorney. Like if I get a letter from an attorney, I'm going to go like, I'm getting sued. <laughs> so, um, so he said, technically it was not a lawsuit error instrument. It was a cease and desist. Um, and basically all those companies uh, agreed that they would change the instruments uh, to some degree, which is why I like Ibanez uh, stopped doing the V. That's another thing too, I think. Um, so what do I know about them? Um, you know, I, the double-edged sword, those lawsuit error instruments, in my opinion, a lot of overhype on them. In other words, some of them are good, okay? But... I think it's also a perception of the time. Um, so I have worked on so many of those, okay? So many, and there's so many different brands. And I'm mostly focused right now, so you know, on the main Japan ones. A lot of them, the quality of the componentry is crap. The hardware is not very good. A lot of them are multi-laminate plywood bodies, like plywood, like vertical, not plywood, like hunks of plywood where we see like, the, the new PRS tellies and stuff where the three pieces of body, you know, wood and stuff. The, the plywood, like, ply. <laughs> um, so, essentially, like, some of the stuff when I go through them, and part of that is also, you can understand, is that some of these guitars are 30 years old when I was working on them, and they've been abused, and so I, I'm like, you know, how much of this has now been destroyed by the, you know, years of being used. And maybe I, if I'm not impressed by it, it's because it's, you know, it's a beat up guitar, but I've also played certain ones and I go, wow, this is pretty magical and sounds great. So I think in my personal assessment of it is a lot of people just say like, they're all great, but I have not experienced that. I have experienced when we're talking about lawsuit air instruments, which first of all, not of them, not all of them are considered lawsuit air. They're just, they happen to be there, but they weren't part of the, that cease and desist. Um, but, uh, the, I think that some are good, some are great and some are crap. And you just kind of, kind of find them in, in the, in the, you know, diamonds in the rough, so to speak. But I think the idea that they're all somehow great, especially in today's, uh, market. And, and I want to tell you too, cause I, I remember upsetting a lot of people uh, as about six years ago when I said this, um, I made a comment once in a video, it's still up to this day, and I still stand by it. So it's been six years and I still stand by this, which is this, and I, I happen to have a Schecter right here, this Schecter guitar right here. Um, I I personally think some of these Korean made Schecters and now some Indonesian Schecters, um, quality wise, when you go through them, they are far better than what you got 30 years ago in a, in a Japanese made guitar. Um, not only is the craftsmanship and the workmanship on par with the quality, just component wise and stuff, they're great. Now, some people don't like those guitars. I understand that and I understand your thing. And as a person who's really into uh, Japan made instruments, especially like I have tons of them from my Gretches to Ibanez's and stuff. I'm not saying the Japanese stuff isn't great. It's great, it's fantastic. But I, I, some, I sometimes will argue, just working on them all, all these guitars all the time. Sometimes I, I look at Schecter guitars type guitars. And I think, God, these are probably better 
quality, better components, and cheaper, even with inf the inflation figured in. So sometimes when I think about that, about these lawsuit air guitars, I think they're really cool. I think they're collectible. I think a lot of them got some mojo, like I said. But sometimes I pick some up and I go, dude, you can just buy a really nice guitar made in Indonesia now for half of what that guitar is going for use, and it's a better quality instrument. So it's tough. Like I said, it's just, and like I said, I'm not a huge blanket statement kind of person. I don't like to say like everything is good or everything is bad, but, um, you know, I, I, I do, I'd like, like to use the law of averages to me. It's like, I think you're going to, if you, if you pick up 50 Schecter guitars in this, in the same price point, okay, you're going to find, you're going to get about 45 great guitars are very good guitars. And so same thing, you know, so to me, it's like when you're looking at those old, uh, uh, lawsuit era guitars, especially now <laughs> with all the stuff that's been done to them over the years. Um, I did a, uh, an Ibanez one. It was a 73 in 1973. I worked on a 1973 Ibanez lawsuit era guitar for the Tone King. He still has it. And I did a bunch of work to it, including swapping pickups and stuff. And he, uh, he told me, he's like, give it to me honest. What do you think of it? Is it great? Is it bad? Cause he said he, he wasn't digging the vibe and he's heard that these are great. I said, it's not great. I said, it's okay. I said, well, well, we'll fix it up. So I worked on it and stuff and we got it much better. I did, you know, his frats, I did stuff. And he's like, he, when he got it, he said, yeah, it's much better. I said, yeah, you know, but he bought it cause he wanted a birth year guitar and he, you know, obviously 73 Gibson was going to be too much money. So he thought, Hey, that'd be fun. And it was good guitar, but I think I forgot what he paid for it. Maybe it's a thousand dollars now, whatever it was, it wasn't like, you know, back in the day we scored him for nothing. It was, it was good money. It was so, so there you go. Okay, next. Um, Grumpy Mike Guitar says, are you 100% correct about Dan Electro 59? I love, oh, you are, you are. He's like, he didn't say, are you? I'm like, oh, you are 100% correct about the Dan Electro 59. I love this thing. And it's sparkly. I saw your blue one. You got the blue one, which is great. Um, yeah, I love the Dane Electro 59 guitar. Um, I argue that, I mean, the, the problem now is when I, when I did my videos on that guitar and maybe now with the, the massive discounts on guitars right now, like tis, tis the season to buy these guitars right now because guitars are dirt cheap. Um, I would say when I think about how crazy this is, when I reviewed the Dane Electro 59, you could buy them for 499 new. And I thought for 500 bucks, it's made in Korea. And that guitar not only sounds great, but it's legit. Like ro real rock stars have great collections of guitars on the stage and still have the same 59 Dan Electro 59 that you can buy online because they're not getting, you know, a lot of them are not buying the old ones. They're buying their issues. And, um, but you know, they've inched up over the years to 700 bucks and that, that gets a little tough, you know, to, to praise a guitar that's almost a thousand dollars like that, even though it's really good. Um, but right now I'm, I'm hoping grumpy Mike, you got a deal too, cause you can get deals out there. Um, it is a great guitar. It's one of my favorite ones. It's really cool. I think uh, the fit and finish on them are great. I, and again, this is one of those things that I think that uh, Steve did when he took over Dan Electro and he brought the guitars back. Um, when he started having them made overseas in Korea, I think he's made he's had he has them making better guitars than they made back in the day when they were made in Japan and the U.S. Um, so there you go. Uh, Ray says, I went into a Long and McQuaid. Uh, so for those of you guys watching, uh, Long and McQuaid is like the Guitar Center equivalent in Canada. So uh, I've never been to one. I've heard it's better than a Guitar Center, but it's definitely like a big chain of stores and it's in Canada. He said $1,700 plus Canadian for a made Mexico Strat. They used to be $599 used, $200 at a yard sale. Yeah, well, you know, times are changing. Um, good news right now though, is if you're going to buy a guitar, they are cheap. You can find deals. These Black Friday deals, these website oh, deals, uh, uh, somebody sent me a thing saying Anderton's is blowing out, um, like 2,800 different SKUs. So if you're in Europe, you know, do the deals are there. Anderton's are blowing out things. Uh, Sweetwater's blowing out stuff. Um, I got a guitar on Black Friday. I got a D'Angelico and I got to tell you, it's made in Indonesia and it is amazing. And um, I, I wanted this guitar really bad because I've been wanting a Gibson ES339 and I just, the Gibson ES339 is driving me crazy because there's different necks for different years. So the new one has a slightly thicker neck. And then if I want the 60 style neck, you got to find the one that had that one and they're expensive. And 
So I was hoping this would fit the bill and absolutely love it. I think it's, I actually love it more than a Gibson ES339. Uh, I, I can tell you right now. I, I, I so, um, and, um, you know, for $699 for these guitars. Um, some uh, some updates, I mentioned that Sweetwater had for $699. I mentioned you could go on on and find better deals through uh, Pitbull Audio and all the things. And uh, one of my uh, viewers, one of the patrons, uh, bought one uh, for $499, but then got an email the next day or two days later. I think it was over the weekend. I think it sucks. And it's saying that they, they're going to refund his money. And then I think they took a while to refund his money on top of that um, because I'm sure they sold out and they just didn't you know, update their site over the weekend, which sucks. Um, oh, Paul saying Anderton sale is ending today, but this is what I'm going to tell you guys. If the high prices of guitars have been really eating at you guys, like all the stuff, all the inflation, all this stuff is eating at you. Um, this is the time, man. They're, they're really dumping inventory. Everybody's out there. The spark go, which I obviously bought and loved. Think about how funny this is. I bought it for $129 in November. <laughs> right? I bought it in November. Okay. <laughs> okay. I bought the Spark Go, uh, in November for $129.99. Then they dropped the price to 109. I emailed Sweetwater and my sales rep, uh, refunded me $20, which was very nice of him. Now it's $99. <laughs> I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I even looked at Sean and I said, should I email him and be like, Hey, can you match 99? I'm like, I can't do it. I already, I just feel like, oh, it's, you know what? For 10 bucks. I, I just, oh, even as much as it bugs me to know. Right. Um, but so you guys know, if you've been thinking about spark, go $99 there once this, they're not going to be $99 again. They're going to stop making that thing or <laughs> right. Once they get the inventory under control. So a lot of these companies are really blowing out inventory. So go out there. The reason I'm telling you that is like, you know, there's, there's fake deals too. Don't get me wrong. That's why you got to be smart and pay attention, but they're deals. This is real stuff. This is real discounts that you may not see, you know, um, you know, I can't imagine unless they can't move this inventory. But so, you know, if you guys haven't, uh, you know, watched the Black Friday metrics, they're saying the sales are up overall uh, 5% from last year or something like that. But more importantly, I'm going to tell you uh, just again, I talk about our industry, our industry this week, uh, the communications that I received from the majority of my friends in the industry were, was that they moved a lot of product. So, it, I mean, it was crazy. People were out there. You guys are out there buying. We're out there buying. So, so, um, just letting you guys know to, to be out there. Um, you know, if that's uh, save some money, right? So yeah, Brian says it's worth $99 for the Bluetooth speaker. I, I agree. It's really cool. Um, for 99 bucks, I can't imagine, uh, you know, a, a fun or little travel, get, you know, amp. So, so. Um, so yeah, a lot of, lot of deals. And of course, if you, uh, more important to mention as we always mention on this channel, cause again, trying to put money back in your guys' pockets. If you find a product right now, especially now, and you can't find a deal for it, or the deal doesn't seem as deep as other deals you're seeing, get on a phone, get, talk to people. Like I said, people make deals with people, you know, get, get, get your mom and pop on the phone, go in your mom and pop store, call your, your, your sales rep at your, you know, guitar center or at Sweetwater, wherever you, wherever you're purchasing this stuff from, you know, get, talk to somebody, whether you physically talk to them on their phone. Uh, I just made this joke last yesterday on the, on the patron thing. I said, I'm so old. I use the old timey phone instead of this is how you, this is how you know how old you are. If you say this is how you call someone, this means you're old as he you know, hell. <laughs> because this, like, if think of this. If some people are probably looking at this, going, "What is he doing? Why is he hang ten on his face? You know, hang ten to make a phone call." Yeah, no, this is how you make a phone call. But back in the day, this is this is what we thought. <laughs> this is what making a phone call would look like. Um, the um, anyways, uh, <laughs> make a phone call if you're. If you're, if you're too intimidated because new, you know, younger people don't like talking anymore, it's just too hard. Uh, cause you know, talking is like being a blacksmith, just this antiquated thing. Uh, just message them. <laughs> they all have chats. All these websites have chats. The mom, pop, pop stores have emails, email, message them, ask them for a deal. Uh, and just ask, like I said, ask them the price match. Um, so, you know, I believe that's what Robert did. Uh, the, the patron, I think after, uh, he got his refund and stuff, I think he went to Sweetwater and I think I, I saw on the WhatsApp, he said, um, something to the fact that Sweetwater didn't like give him the exact deal, but they got it closer, right? They got, they moved the needle a little bit that way. So, so basically, like I said, that's, that's a, you know, 
that's good because again it's money in your pocket you know this is stuff we don't need and so uh put that money in your pocket especially with the world the way it is right now um you know it helps it helps justify your purchases <laughs> and especially since these companies really would like to move a lot of product i don't i don't know anybody right now who's like man you know very few companies are like man i wish i, wish I could get some product everybody's like i wish i could get rid of this product <laughs> so uh, help them do it why not help the economy help yourself uh okay we have Casperius, I uh, I'm, I probably butchered it. it. Says uh, putting in a full size humbucker into a Gretsch G fifty two sixty T. Okay, uh, pickup routes are one point five two time at uh, times three point six zero. Any creative ideas on hiding the over leftover gaps? So that yes, so you're putting full size humbuckers into it, but. The problem is the frames. So the answer, so let me let me uh, tell you what you need to do, okay? Uh, I don't even need to know all the measurements. What you need to look for, let me type this in, humbucker, typing in, so to speak. It's all about knowing what to search for. Humbucker sized Gretsch style pickup rings. So, um, yes. So I'll see all roads always lead to Stu Mac. So like I always said, uh, always go to Stu Mac for any problems, look at their webs, look at their stuff. But again, I'm not telling you, you have to buy from Stu Mac. Um, you can get this stuff somewhere else. This is what I think you're looking for. Something like this. This is how, so believe it or not, um, they make pickup rings that are designed to obviously, uh, hold a full size humbucker in a Gretsch style guitar. But more importantly, these are a little thicker. These, these, um, I don't know what you'd call these <laughs> the sides. The sides are slightly thicker. So you might want to check the measurements like this. If this isn't what you need to fit your needs, um, trust me, go look every other places on the internet, but there is like, for instance, look at this. Um, this is what you're looking for. See stuff like this. Um, here's a, a part. This is ugly. At least it looks ugly, but it's a humbucker to mini humbucker adapter. That's humbucker to mini. So it, you may, I'm sorry, I took you the wrong direction. We want to go. Uh, from the like a TV Jones style to a full size, but with a uh, a larger a larger um, sides, and so there's a way to do that. Um, there's also a ring, another ring that can go underneath that pickup ring. So there are adapters. So um, the uh, Casperius. So the good news is is that your problem is not necessarily uh, hard. I've done it many times. I just haven't done that particular your particular issue. Um, I have put full size humbuckers. I've done it both ways. I've had the hell of both. I've put the, you know, I had to take out the, the Gretsch style, uh, uh, full size humbucker out and put a TV Jones style pickup in it. And I've had to do it both ways. And there's always an adapter, uh, out there for it. So you don't have to get creative. Somebody's already done it for you. Cause it's, uh, so there you go. Uh, J J van, J van B two, three, one says, did you unpack a Tex your Texas toast challenger? Um, I had heard, uh, from some of you guys that Texas Toast sent a guitar. Um, the way, so you guys know, because some of you guys, you guys send me stuff, especially like gifts and stuff, like little stuffed animals or whatever, everything. Um, so this stuff goes, It's it doesn't go to me per se. Um, so uh, the, everything is kind of filtered through and given to me. So the only thing I unpacked today, the only thing I got today so now of course after the show i'm going to be curious to see if there's a guitar um is i got my d'angelico guitar today so that i'm usually if i'm if i have something with a tracking number coming to me that i'm aware of i'm going to pay attention to the tracking number um this is where it gets a little embarrassing to say but we get packages every single day <laughs> and i only see like seven days a week from all kinds of, you know, for all the levels. Sometimes it's materials for pickups, because uh, I'm making pickups. Sometimes it's, you know, products for videos. Sometimes we call it unsolicited, just random stuff shows up a lot. Um, in fact, I was, um, I'm gonna be working up in the month of December, a special giveaway, uh, which is a lot of stuff, because a lot of companies will send me, we call it unsolicited, like this, you know, they can't get us, um, to answer an email or I'm missing something or somehow we're not communicating with them and they want to get something on the show, so to speak. So they'll just send it. And, um, like 
like I don't want to tell you what it is yet, but it's like this cool little amphiphone thing, headphone thing. Um, and we get this stuff and I'm like, I, I don't, I don't think people understand. Like, I don't know what to do with this. I can't just make, I don't make a video every day. So it would be like, I'd have to make a, you know, like I have to add a video to this, the thing. So I will check. I would check. Like I said, I heard that there is something coming. So I'm kind of curious. Uh, so I'll check it out. But, uh, yeah. It's tough, man. It's tough right now. Um, but like I said, I I was uh, I had the tracking number. Like I have an amp coming Tuesday, and I'm very aware of that. Uh, for me personally, I bought an amp from a YouTuber. <laughs> the sickness never never ends. Uh, so there you go. I will look. Thank you, Jvan B two three one. John Clark says all taxes are passed along to customers. It is not a penalty on the company. The consumers pay the penalty. Yeah, John. Again, I don't want to get... He's talking. He's in reference. This is in reference to uh, my comment about my friend who said there should be like a landfill tax. Um, keep in mind, the, the, I think the terminology, the joke was landfill tax. I don't uh, think of it like a fee. In other words, like if a company can't prove they can make a product that lasts, maybe they should have to pay to you know for the landfill kind of concept. Um, again, it wasn't a discussion about the government and taxation and how this all works. Um, you know, all, all people, everyone gets screwed. <laughs> so there's no, uh, I don't want to go down that road because obviously we probably all have a lot of the same, uh, opinions on that. I think it was more of a, a discussion of like, uh, somebody was saying, doesn't they make a, some companies make a lot of junk. And I was basically saying, I had a friend once saying like companies who make junk should have to pay more, right? Um, you know, have to pay some kind of penalty or something for basically making junk. Um, I don't know how you would regulate that or do things. Like I said, it's, it's more of a, you know, we're pontificating here. If I actually knew how to solve the world's problems, I sure as hell wouldn't be talking about guitars on a Friday show. Um, so it was more of a, like, wouldn't it be cool if, um, I get what you're saying. I'm just saying, understand that what I'm talking about is, wouldn't it be cool if companies had to basically, uh, you know, if they made good products and they didn't, they didn't get, you know, penalized. And if they made crappy products, they'd get penalized. Maybe it would change their attitudes about things. Right. So when a company makes a decision to use a, a crappier component in a product, knowing that it's not going to last as long, wouldn't it be nice in the grand scheme of like, if the world was fair, if that company would have to kind of take it on the chin. And your point is, uh, that the, cu the customer would pay it. Well, I think that's actually the point too. The point would be that, um, hey, a crappy thing, $70 and a good thing, $70 because the crappy thing had to pay this tax. And so if you knew two things, if there was two products that were equally the same price and one lasted 10 years and one lasted two, why would you buy the one that only lasts two? Or, you know, you get the idea, but, but I understand, like I said, we don't want to get too deep into that. It, to, to me, it makes the show not fun if we go too far off the rails, but I, I appreciate your comment and I agree with you. So, you know, that's basically my whole way of saying I agree with you. I just don't want to go too far that down that road. Uh, Enrico says, uh, what does he say? He says, best way to gauge a guitar needing a truss rod adjustment versus saddle bridge height. Sure. Um, so the way I like to do it the fastest is um, especially, uh, you know, if you're setting the neck, let's say you have high action um, or if you have buzz. I like to pay attention to whether or not it's happening at the first five frets or if it's happening at, let's say, around the 12th fret or higher, okay? I know there's a kind of gap in the middle. I don't really care about that. So to me, like if I was playing a guitar and it was really buzzing on the first, second, third fret, but playing absolutely fine on the 12th fret, you know, the 10th fret, the 14th fret around that area, everything's fine, I would say that maybe the neck needs relief, right? And again, there's, you can sight the neck, you can do all kinds of things, you know, right? You can use a straight edge, but I'm just going off of just playing it. I just intuitively would go, yeah, that's where I think the prop's gonna be at. If I was playing a guitar and I played an open G chord or I was playing up again around the first, second, third, fourth, fifth fret, around that, the money chords as sometimes they refer to. Um, if I was playing the <laughs> first to fifth fret and it was playing fine, but all of a sudden it chokes out at the 12th fret, then maybe I would think maybe that's a saddle adjustment. And again, that's just a gauge and where to get you started. And what's great is that you just need to know where to start making the adjustments. And I think that's the core of your question. That's why it's a great question because a lot of people are like, where do I start? I think once you know how to start solving the problem, it, it, it becomes real intuitive to where to go after that. Uh, John own 13 can't play any. 
uh, which I love because I think it always means... He, I'm curious one day if John uh, owns 13, because I think it means guitars and can't play any. Wouldn't it be funny if John 13 one day becomes like John 17? <laughs> or like, John, buying guitars. Uh, he says, got frustrated with the guitar, took a few months a break. Oh, got frustrated with guitar, so he means playing guitar. Took a few months uh, for a break and still can't stand the look at any guitar, any ideas to get my interests back. You know, that's, that's a question that comes up pretty frequently on the show. You know, the burnout, right? Um, and, uh, yes, <laughs> uh, I, you know, it's, there's different answers. I could give you 20 different answers and some might work and some might work, not work, but here's the answer that it works for me. So I'll just to tell you where that, cause I burn out a lot. And to me, sometimes burning out is the worst thing to happen to me because um, this is how I make a living. So you can imagine, right? You know, think about that. It's like one thing if it's your joy and you're like, ah, I want more joy. But also keep in mind, you're like, hey, I don't think I'm going to make the rent <laughs> if, I don't, if I don't figure out how to enjoy playing guitar, talking about guitars, especially talking about guitars. Sometimes I'm just like, I'm sick of looking at them and stuff. Um, so first, I think you did a smart thing, taking a break, finding something else to do. You know, you don't have to be guitar all the time. Um, the, and, and now you're coming back. Maybe you just need more time. But here's another idea too is, and and this is the answer. I've given different answers over the years to this question and I've refined them. So I just want to give you, this is more a refined answer. I don't think you actually, I don't think you have to worry about falling in love with guitar or being in love with the guitar. I think you just need to be in love with music. Um, so that's where it is. Like somebody's saying set goals. See, I've, I've used all those answers too. set goals, learn a new song, you know, right. Try a different thing. Find some of the musicians to play with all of those answers that the, you're getting and you're going to see them in the comments people are going to have. They're all valid and very good answers. And all of any one of those can work. But one thing I want to tell you is don't forget that the love of this is music. Like that's, that's the love, right? And sometimes, um, I think that's where sometimes like, here's a good answer. I gave this answer to a friend the other day. And so I'm hoping it might uh, apply to you. Um, the friend, a friend of mine is having a problem because he got two guitars and they're pretty identical to what each other. And he wants to keep one and he keeps a being them. And he goes, I love this about one. And I love this about the other one. And he's him and Han. And what he wanted me to do was be a tiebreaker. Like, you know, play them and tell me which one's better. And so my suggestion to him, which he did, is I said, why don't you turn on a recorder, right? Whatever you use to record music, turn on a drum track, turn on a recorder, whatever it is, play a song with each guitar. You could do a cover song, but I think actually write a song. Play a, like Your goal is to make music with this thing. Don't forget that, right? This is the goal. This thing is to make music. It's a tool, right? If it was a hammer, it wants a nail, right? It's a guitar. It wants music to come out of it. And play play a song and then tell me what you think. And this is what happened to him. Uh, one guitar, he, he said, for some reason, like he ended up using a looper and he wrote a song on a looper and he said, the song just came out of the guitar and the other guitar, he says, like, I, th I think it actually sounds a little better, but he's like, but I just knew a song was in this guitar. And then we got this like philosophical, like we felt cheesy, like, you know, you know, cause you know, it's cheesy. We're like, yeah, this guitar just doesn't have a song in it. <laughs> right. And I think it can be as simple as that for you. Um, you know, you're not feeling the guitar, but is there a song in that guitar? Is there a song in you? Is there something that has to come out? Um, and if not, you then just keep listening to music and keep doing other things. Uh, Brian said, go fishing, go fishing, do other things, right? Um, you know, f find the passion. And, and so, you know, this is another thing too. Remember playing the guitar is not the only way to enjoy guitar. You can work on guitars. I mean, some, I, I have viewers that I have, I've talked with in great, great length and they don't even really play guitar very much. They play the guitar a little bit, but they really like working on them. They like fixing them up. <laughs> you know, it's just like anything where you do repairs or you, you modifications. So like I said, I, I would, I would try a couple of those ideas. Anyone, any of the suggestions they're giving you too, but I, like I said, don't forget it's music first. Um, so, uh, it's just, you know, it's finding it's, you know, if you're like, oh, I'm playing a couple songs and I'm just not finding any music. Well, keep looking. Cause it's music first. So, okay. So let's see. 
Uh, let's do, I'm, I'm jumping off the, okay, this one is from Easy Possum. <laughs> <laughs> this is Amanda sent me. Uh, it says, hey, Phil, just bought a Gibson Les Paul from the Gibson demo shop in Nashville. Does the demo stamped on the back of the headstock affect, affect the value of the guitar? Um, yeah, it could affect it positive or negative, right? It depends on what it is uh, on the demo shop. So there are cool and crazy things going on in that world of uh, Gibson, right? So you gotta understand, get, what Gibson's doing with the demo shop is a very cool and interesting idea. It's essentially not just B-stock guitars, but they're taking, like, for instance, like I noticed one time they had a, uh, an, uh, a signature artist, Les Paul, and they painted it. <laughs> And they didn't call it that signature artist guitar anymore. They like changed it into a different guitar. Um, and so you're like, that's kind of hilarious, right? So you're buying a, like a slash Les Paul, but now it's been made into a different guitar because uh, they painted it differently and they changed things. And they obviously they painted it because they wanted to cover up all the stuff that signified as slash and they made some adjustments. And then of course now it's a demo shop guitar uh, or a mod shop guitar, right? Whatever. Um, so the demo shop mod shop thing could be cool. Um, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't remember first. I don't like, that's why when I did the, the collection video I did the other day, uh, we had this long, deep discussion with the patrons yesterday about this. So I'll give you the summarized version. I don't like having too much of a discussion about the whole investment of guitars. I don't want this channel or I don't want to be a person that only speaks about investing and, and making money. Obviously saving money is different right? Saving money is smart. <laughs> you want to save money. Investing in stuff, I, I hate getting too deep in that uh, that pool because, again, I, I'd be lying to you if I told you that's where my focus is. Most of my time, my focus is, is how do I just keep this stuff reasonable as a reasonable person financially? Um, but in your case, the answer is yes to both. It could make the guitar worth more in a few years. Somebody might find it interesting and unique, or yeah, it might not be because and so it really depends on what you bought and how unique it is and how interesting it is. But there is no guarantee either direction. And like I said, each, each guitar would be like a case gate by case scenario. Okay. Um, hold on. Okay, hold on, I'm just jumping around real quick. All right, we have Christopher says, will you be doing a demo of the new Saldano? There's a new Saldano? I didn't even know. <laughs> uh, uh, new Saldano amp. Uh, products, Saldano. I don't know. If I go to Saldano.com, is it there? Release. I have, uh, they're not showing it. Am I missing something? I thought they made the 30, the mini, and the full size. Um, so the answer is no. So uh, Boutique Amp Distribution is who makes Saldano. Uh, so as you know, they make the Tone King amps as well. And um, they're a company that doesn't seem to reach out very much to me. I mean, it's very few and far between. I haven't worked, oh, I think I have when I did the minis. So I, was, I have worked with them since COVID, but... Um, like I said, a lot of the times, like the Friedman stuff, I usually buy it and that's how it gets on the channel. So stuff like that, it would, you know, again, if it's not on my radar to buy and you guys aren't mentioning it, but now you mentioned it, maybe it's something I'll be interested in checking out and putting it on the channel. Um, but as a company, they're not reaching out for anything. So I haven't heard anything about it. I'll check it out. Um, it's funny, again, uh, we just had a conversation about my personal Saldano and how I'm thinking about letting it go. <laughs> I don't know. Probably won't, but I think about it sometimes. Um, Matt says, I was shocked that I was able to get a Marshall Studio vintage head for $9.99. That's like $750 off. Yeah. Well, again, overstock, you know, especially, um, especially, like I said, anything that came on a boat towards the end of COVID, it's just, you know, they're just to have lots of it. So, you know, it, it's, it's. it has to do, and I, I've talked about this before, it has to do with how long they have to project when to put those orders in, right? So if you have companies that are like, it takes a year sometimes. It could take six months or a year um, to for when they put an order with a factory to get the product. 
that a lot of those companies that are in that situation are in the overstock situation because they were buying, they were ordering product when things were booming and then the stuff showed up way past the boom. Um, the companies though that are like just in time manufacturing, in other words, they get orders and they fill the orders. Those companies, a lot of them, when you talk to them, that's where the variance, the variant comes in where you're like, but this company doesn't seem to be discounting and they don't seem to care. And it's because they, they're making stuff exactly in the time that are getting orders. So, um, so there you go. Uh, Bob, Bobby drew slower than you. <laughs> I think it's a sh shooting reference, right? Uh, he says along the same lines of mod shop, how do Kiesel guitars hold up in value? It depends. I mean, obviously the Kiesel guitars, um, look, the Kiesel guitars hold a much higher value, uh, than you think. And the reason I know that is because I'm constantly looking at used Kiesels on, um, on reverb and, uh, every time I go, wow, that, that guy's asking too much for his Kiesel. It's sold. I'm like, okay, well, maybe I don't understand the Kiesel market. Um, when I did have lunch with Jeff, one of the things I told him was he has definitely improved the resale value of Kiesel. The Kiesel resale value is a far cry from what it was when it was the Carvin, com Carvin branded guitars. The Carvin branded guitars resale value was, was in the same league, in my opinion, as PV and Godin good quality stuff. People knew that it was quality, but it just didn't have resale value. Um, Kiesel, you know, I hear people all the time going, Kiesel resale values suck. Uh, go on reverb and buy one dirt cheap, then I dare you. You're not going to find one. Not dirt cheap. It's crazy. I mean, Carvin back in the day, if a Carvin was in, in today's money, if a Carvin was $2,500 new, um, you could pick it up for $500 used <laughs> in today's money, right? Now it would be more reference of if it's twenty five hundred dollars new, you're going to be paying eighteen hundred dollars. You're going to pay about seventy percent of what it is new, uh, which is pretty good, and sometimes more. Um, and it, but the same rule applies to the to the demo shop mod shop thing with Gibson as Kiesel, which is if you want if that's something you care about, you know your resale value of Kiesel, don't get crazy, keep it normal, right? The more normal you keep it, um, you got to understand a Kiesel guitar is going to be exactly like a car. Um, in the idea that if you buy every option on that car, you are going to take a bigger hit when you resell it, right? Because not everybody cares about the heated seats and all that stuff, right? Like option packs don't really hold value, right? No different than your house, right? A pool is not going to add a whole lot of money to your resale value as, as, a, as a cost. Um, the same thing with the Kiesel. You got to be smart about the, if you're, tr if you're thinking you might want to have to sell this thing in the, in the future, you definitely want to keep it more base model, right? Um, because uh, you, it can get crazy fast. Like you could take a, a Kiesel, you can take a, a fifteen hundred dollar guitar, and you can make that guitar four thousand dollars. I'm gonna tell you right now, very, that's what I see a lot of people having issues with. Is you're not gonna get, um, you're not gonna get, <laughs> you know, full boat for all those uh, items. Um, Jeff himself said one of the problems they have when people cancel an order is, is that it's tough to sell a lot of those um, instruments that get canceled because. When people pay the kind of money they're paying for those guitars, they want what they want. And if they're not going to get exactly what they want, they want a big discount. So it is a, is a factor. And I've always said before, keep in mind that if resale is the only factor you care about, just keep in mind, resale values are obviously Gibson and Fender have the best resale values if that's what you're focused on. So, uh, but I get it. And I get it. And, and one of the things that always comes up always whenever we have these resale conversations is guitar players will always say, well, I don't think about resale value. I don't even think about that stuff. The reason guitar players think about resale value before they even got the guitar is they know that they flipped a lot of guitars because, you know, not everything lines up, you know, not all the stars align. And so they know that that is something that might be potentially possible in the future. And they just don't want to take a huge hit. No one wants to spend, you know, $3,000 on a guitar, $500 on a guitar to get a fraction of what they paid you know, it's, 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 it's tough. So, but, um, but again, like I said, <laughs> Lou York says guitars have heated seats. They probably can. <laughs> so, um, okay. Uh, let's see. Let's, uh, okay. Hold on. All 
I'm, I'm just looking for responses on that commentary. Uh, uh, LP5369 GT says, I think I don't see a lot of Kiesels because people have too, so much vested in them. First of all, they don't make very many Kiesels. So Kiesel is doing uh, probably better than it's ever done before. And um, and uh, I'm just going to tell you, I don't remember if he said it was okay to tell you or not. I don't think he's going to have a problem with it. They're, they were they were Last year, they made 4,000 guitars. Um, that was their number. That may sound a, sound like a lot. I, I want to give you a, 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 a um, uh, some, some numbers, <laughs> right? Um, so that means that 4,000 guitars, um, they're making considerably a lot less than uh, any production guitars for sure. Like we talked about in that tour that Fender can pump out 400 in a day. Um, Paul Reese with private stock is not, is not making 4,000 guitars a year, but they're not making far less than 4,000, uh, guitars a year. Uh, the, so, you know, um, capacity at Kiesel is probably to make 5,000 guitars is what I got from him. He said they can make five, but they're not trying to hit capacity. They're actually trying to decrease capacity, um, because of the fact that, um, and again, I don't want to put words in his mouth. He wasn't saying this, but this is what I got from obviously being there and having been in 36 different factories around the world. And what I can tell was that it seems like they were doing what a lot of companies were doing during COVID, which was they were trying to meet the demand. And when they were moving that fast, fenders obviously felt the brunt of this probably harder than most companies, which is when you move that fast, you wear your employees out, you put out subpar product. So uh, Kiesel basically said that for 2024, they're not looking to increase the amount of guitars they make. They're actually maybe looking at decreasing the amount of guitars they make, making fewer or less guitars. So that's not to drive price up by making less guitars. It's just, again, why, why push your... Why why run the engine as hard as you can when you know you're going to have issues? So, like I said, it sounds like a lot of guitars. That's not a lot of guitars. That's a lot of guitars for a very small shop. That's nothing compared to the big scale guitar companies. So, like I said, there's not a lot. You're not going to see a lot of those guitars on the market uh, because not not only because people, you know, his comment was basically people keep them because they love them too much. That could be possible, but you can understand they're just not making the same amount of guitars as some of the bigger guys are doing for sure. So, um, okay. Um, Tom says, Tone Jar, thanks once again uh, to you and the community. Hey, man, I appreciate it. That was a nice super chat. I like, he gave me, a, I think, a beer emoji too. So it's a super chat for beers. <laughs> so, uh, see ya. Okay, um, we have... Okay, hold on. Um, I'm pulling this up real quick. Okay, we have a couple there. Okay, so here's one from Randy who says, Hey, Phil, I, I like, I really like the Epiphone Greeny. Can't swallow the price. Looks like a Gibson tribute. Well, we'll have to do USA guitar for more affordable than a Chinese one. Yeah. Well, the greenie, of course, you know, we know that's a, the strategy is it's a percent, it's a price based on how, on, on how big, uh, on how expensive the expensive one is. So Epiphone, again, things changed. Inflation has changed some of the numbers. Some of the numbers are going to have to readjust and, and change how I explain things because some of the stuff I used to say used to be accurate and some of it's changed. So you got to understand that generally speaking, uh, the Squire to Fender, the SE to Core, the Epi to Gibson is usually around, based around the concept of 25%. And so you know, you'll find that to be semi-accurate even in today's market, which means if you take a guitar um, that is, like I said, a Gibson Les Paul, you take that model and you find the exact same Epiphone model, that model will be 25% of what the 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 full the, the the full price of the higher end unit is same with the SEs right you'll see the same kind of logic right so if a core guitar and you don't realize it because some people will go and if you and if you understand this concept and if you understand that the numbers can vary between 20 percent to 30 percent but let's say 25 is a is look at here's here's let me show you this um because sometimes especially uh 
especially guitar players who buy the SEs to, and don't look at cores, right? Because a lot of times, like, you know, you're not looking at cores, okay? So now the SEs are going to be skewed, okay, because they're on sale right now. But I'll, I'll, I'm going to share with this with you. I just want to share you using this. Okay, so here we have a custom 24, right? So here's a good example. Here's a PRS SE custom 24. Eight, it's 750 bucks. Now that's the discount deal. See, it's 190 bucks off, right? So basically this should be about 950. Okay. So 950 bucks. So let's see what a custom 2408 is. And let's try not to find a 10 top. So that's 5,500 for the 10 top. So we should be looking for a non 10 top pattern, thin faded with 10 top. A lot of these are going to be 10 tops. Here's one. Okay. So here's a custom 24. I know it's not the 24, but they're both custom 24s. It's $4,555. So if you take $4,555 times 0.25, so 11, so close. I was close. It's $1,100 is what it should be. So, so I was saying 25, let's take it to 20%. So five, or 4,500 times 20%, $900, right? So it's close. It's somewhere between that 20 and 25. So this is where it gets tricky. The companies all kind of follow this rule, okay? Almost all the brands. So and again, understand it's going to float. It's not going to be 50% and it sure as hell is not going to be 10%. It's going to float, like I said, between 20 and 30%. So when you see a guitar and it flags you like, Wow, that import blah 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 is a thousand dollars. Trust me, then the core, the main one that they're copying, uh, is going to be close to four thousand dollars, which is about twenty five percent. And so that'll tell you how uh, uh, touch. Uh, um, I didn't even know that core Paul Reed Smith guitars were in the mid four thousand five thousand dollar range until I saw an SE at a thousand bucks and I go a thousand, that would make it 4,000. And I looked it up and I go, it's $4,000 for a core PRS. So the greeny Epiphone is that's how the price is determined. So it's not like they, they don't take and look and, and, and go, uh, you know, oh, it costs us $700 to make it. So let's double our money and make it $1,400. They literally are using, a lot of them are using the logic of, of, this is 25% of the cost of the of the expensive one. So this is where you'll buy, you know, and this is how they do it. And there's probably some cool research that they know um, that would make sense. So, and like I said, doing that logic, uh, just using like a Badlands guitar as a reference, that means, uh, so our, the Hollow Flash was at $2,800. So in theory, if Badlands was to make an import model, right, we would expect, that import model to be $699. So if Badlands was to ever make an import uh, version of a, of a core guitar, that's that's how you'd figure out what that would be at. And that's a big, so, and then and then the, my guess is you would reverse from there. You'd back into it. You'd go, okay, now we want the guitar to be 699, how do we get it there? And then, and that's why sometimes you understand, now if you know that, now you understand why Paul, and I'm picking on Paul Reed Smith. I don't mean to because it's just it's just easier in this analogy. The PRS guitars were made in Korea, right? Now they're made in Indonesia. Well, it's because they're focused on, and I'm not saying Paul Reed Smith specifically, specifically. I'm just saying uh, com companies are focused on this 25% guideline, right? Um, and so essentially, if all of a sudden the Korean manufacturer saying, oh, you got to pay, it's going to be $1,500, you know, after what you pay for it, then you want your profit, your dealer's profit, and you get it in. There's, it's it's $1,500 to make the import version. Um, PRS doesn't want to go, oh, well, we don't want it, you know, 40% of the way to our core. We don't want it too close to the core. So they're going to move manufacturing, which is what they did. If you watch the interview I did on my second channel with Jack Higginbotham, he openly and clearly said this, and that's why I, I loved it because he's very truthful. He basically said it just got too expensive to make guitars in Korea, so we went to Indonesia. Some people had a negative uh, comments in the video about that. Some people had some positive comments about it. It's, it's a business logic. Like I said, you could sit there and go, people said, oh, that's horrible. You should have stayed in Korea. And I'm like, those same people probably wouldn't pony up the $1,500 to $1,800 for that same guitar that's $799 now. So again, it's a it's a hard it's a hard thing to argue both directions, right? It's it's I, I like having a conversation about it because I think it's interesting to talk about, 
but I don't want to sit here and try to justify either side because there's sucky things about both angles and both ideology. So there you go. So uh, Bud Bud says the greenie was thirty two hundred dollars. So USA. So for fifteen hundred dollars for the year. So they're do, so they're doing about fifty percent, forty percent, right? About forty percent somewhere on there. Uh, so a little higher than my average. But that's also because they added that cool headstock now. <laughs> so the um, <laughs> you know I don't even know. I wonder. I on a side note, I wonder. I don't know if you guys do. I wonder about the whole greenie thing with Gibson. Did they walk into that situation, or did they create it from the get go? What I mean by that is, think about this. They create this greenie replica guitar that's crazy money. It was like twenty five grand, right, or something like that. They create this guitar and it sells out like that, right? I mean, it sells out fast. I mean, it was sold out so fast that there's there was tons of people who were mad they didn't get one. Okay. This inconceivable, inconceivable price point that they got for this guitar. They sell it in a minute. Now, if you're in business, if you do anything in business, okay, and I've told you guys this before, if you put a guitar on reverb and you sell it in 38 seconds, your guitar was too cheap. Okay. All right. You should, that's not a good feeling, right? If you list a guitar and it literally sells in a second, you probably sold it too cheap, right? And and so you're like, oh man. So I'm sure Gibson. Uh, it's possible they con, 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 you know like orchestrated this entire thing, but it's also could be con, that it's they reacted to it. Wow! If we sold that many at this price, what happens if we make a three thousand dollar one? And then they sell those out like they're nothing, like just those zapping out the door, like the same thing. And they're like, holy crap! What if we make a fifteen hundred dollar one? Right? Um, so there you go. So I wonder, like I said, did they know? Did they know that they were going to do this? Because here's the irony of this. If you do the math, if you do the math, which is, I don't care what the markup is, okay? Which on the $25,000 one, the markup's insane, okay? It's an insane markup. Once you're into those guitar prices, um, a lot of people, uh, very uneducated in the industry people <laughs> that have to tend to put comments, love to say things like, there's no justifiable financial reason to make a guitar like two, dollars $3,000. Oh, there absolutely is. Uh, there, there absolutely is uh, justifiable reasons why a guitar could cost so much that the in, in price to be three thousand dollars is it's actually totally understandable. Um, where you're where you're right is you're wrong about that price point because of course you're not factoring in your own job. I mean, like I said, how fast can you make a guitar and what do you get paid? Even if you get paid minimum wage, it gets pretty tricky to get to that price point very quickly. Um, but when you see a guitar twenty thousand dollars, it it's really hard to go, okay, the wood does not get that much more expensive. The labor does not get that much more expensive. Trust me, um, the person making your $25,000 guitar is not making uh, 10 times the labor of the person who made the $3,000 guitar. In fact, in most cases, they're making the same exact or a couple different dollars. In fact, just to give you a reference, something I happen to be aware of that I shouldn't say, um, I, using Fender as an, uh, a good analogy is the employee making your production Fender guitar and your employee in your custom shop Fender are only making a few dollars different per hour. Okay, The price is literally double, but the labor is not doubling. It's not. It's a fact. It's not. There's nobody making custom shop Fender guitars making double what the factory workers making the production guitars are. So that is not a huge part of the reason why the price is doubling up, okay? Um, and so same thing with these $25,000 guitars. No one's making, you know, uh, you know, lawyer hour <laughs> really wage making this guitar. Um, and so there is, there is a factor to that. But realistically, you can only sell some of those guitars. So even with an insane markup, you only make so much money. Um, I, would, I would venture a guess that regardless of what the price of the guitars are, the profit dollars, not percentage, but you know, percentage of, of the guitar, but the total dollars, the net, the money, right? The Epiphone is making a huge amount of money compared to what the greeny um, $3,000 guitar is compared to what that uh, custom shop was, without a doubt, for sure right? It, it's the difference of like, they made a hundred, couple hundred thousand dollars on this one and they made a, a million dollars or $2 million on this one. And now they're making like $5 million on the next one. I mean, it's exponentially, they're making a lot more money because uh, you can make a lot more money selling a more marked up inexpensive guitar. So like I said, I can see where they orchestrated this all to create. I mean, think about this. Pre the greenie, who was looking for a $1,500 Epiphone guitar? <laughs> None of you. <ya. laughs> 
<laughs> that, the 1100 of you sitting here watching this, not a single one of you were like, I wonder if they're ever gonna make a $1,500 Epiphone I could buy. And out of 1100 of you, I have to venture at least two of you guys got an Epiphone, <laughs> got a greenie. And I'm not making fun of you. It's a great guitar. And you know what, sadly enough, regardless of what I feel about the price point is, um, people said they're already flipping them for more money. I could totally see it holding value because it's really captured people. It's like, the, it's the it's the clone marketing logic. It's like the oh, it's the unobtainable, and now it's obtainable, right? You no one can have a greenie. So here's your copy. No one can have a clone. Here's your copy of clone. No one can have a dumble. You make that. It really captures our imagination. Like I said, I'm I'm a sucker for it too. So I'm not making fun of anybody. Literally, the greenie is not my thing that I'm dumb enough to buy, but I've bought many more things twice as dumb, twice more money. So I would never, uh, ever make fun of you. I'm just telling you, I'm. we could have a beer or a soda talking about our, you know, passions and how they get the best of us. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, uh, let's see. There he is. <laughs> you guys are funny, man. Some of these comments. Okay, I need to. <laughs> we need to button up the show. Uh, first, I just to make sure uh, that I didn't miss any super chats, uh, and I don't think I did. And if I did, like I said, we'll get them next week. I uh, just want to make sure the moderators didn't send me anything I need to pay attention to. Oh, go back this way. Okay, hold on a second. Okay, oh. All right, so that's cool, I got those. Um, so, and then, okay, all right, did I get, and I think I got all the early riser ones for the most part. There's a couple things I just wanna finish out the show with these last couple uh, questions that I liked. Claudia J sent me a question. It says, Hey, Phil, happy Friday. What makes a Squire by Fender mini, which is the most important thing we want to get out of this is what makes a Squire mini uh, guitar different than a full size. So, uh, so, uh, she says, I know it's three quarter size, but is the neck shorter? Um, it is. So this is where Cla Claudia, it's a great, great question. I love this question. Um, because sometimes it gets confusing. So a Gibson guitar, 24 and three quarter scale, would mean the neck is shorter than a 25 and a half inch scale neck, okay? The bodies, I know it's different size, you know, shape bodies, but essentially we would say it's a full size body. So if you get a, a guitar that's 24 and three quarters scale versus 25 and a half scale, you would assume that the body shapes are full size body shapes and the necks are considered full size, but one is slightly shorter. Okay, it's a shorter neck, it's not as long. The frets will be a different spacing, of course, you know, a little narrower because of that, but more importantly, just shorter. When somebody says the term three quarter or half size, you're almost talking about a model, right? Uh, it's scaled down, so the whole guitar is scaled down. And this is where it's a little tricky because technically, in my experience, especially with three quarter instruments and half size, that is not equally done, okay? So like if you took a full size car and you said, okay, I'm gonna scale this car down to, you know, a smaller size, we'd be the tires, the windshield, all the, every component of the car would be scaled down. On a three quarters instrument, scale instrument, the body generally is three quarters the size of a full, full size guitar, so it's much smaller, but the neck tends to be slightly out of out of sorts. And what I mean by that is the, the, they shrink the distance, but the width usually doesn't shrink too much. And the reason is, is because even with smaller hands, um, it becomes problematic because a lot of times they do not use special bridges uh, for the, the small scale guitars. They tend to use, the, the, the nut they can shape however they want, but they tend to use a full size bridge. And because the spacing on the bridge is a full size bridge, they can't kind of make the neck the same scale, which works out because most players, even smaller players, that works out. So yes, the answer would be a three quarters scale guitar or half size scale guitar is exactly that, three quarters of the size of a full size guitar or half size physically body and neck, but technically understand that the neck never gets super narrow. If you look at specifications of the guitars, you'll see the neck is a lot shorter, but the width is not a lot narrower, narrower, <laughs> right? It's just a little bit more narrow. Uh, so. 
so again, so the answer is yes, it's correct. It's the scaling, but it's also slight adjustments, just like the knobs, right? The full size, you're gonna, I know it's gonna sell you, the full size pickups, full size knobs, right? Because it, again, it gets too tricky for these manufacturers to um, do. In fact, so you know, one of the biggest problems that all, all manufacturers have, period, when it comes to um, uh, uh, three quarter scale guitars, they have the same problem the furniture industry has with couches and sofas, right? Love seats, right? So when you go and you look at couches, the couch is like, you know, $1,000 for a couch or $2,000, whatever a couch is. And then you look at love seat and you're like, oh, it should be half. <laughs> it's not half. It's like, oh, it's $900. It's like, what? It's because essentially, if you look at the time, they're looking at our work hours, how long it takes to make a couch versus make a couch that's a foot and a half shorter. Uh, man hour wise, they don't really save a whole lot of time. Material wise, it's like, okay, well, yeah, they saved a, you know, a yard of fabric and they saved about a foot of wood. And so mathematically, it doesn't really translate to a lot cheaper. Manufacturing Manufacturers, guitar manufacturers, so you know, three quarters guitars, in my experience, are subsidized by those manufacturers. Uh, I'm not making this up. Uh, you, you know, if you really get down to the the bones of it, most manufacturers like Fender, which is also going to be Jackson, the Ibanez uh, uh, G, uh, uh, Micro Series with a K, um, those guitars, a lot of the guitars, when you look at their price, the price to the full size one, it's pretty dramatic, right? It's like $100, $150 versus the full size, which is $300. But that's because they're just not making a whole lot of money on the small series guitars, which is why a lot of the small series guitars need so much work. They need a lot of work because they literally are, the, the problem is, the problem is, I'm just gonna say, the, <laughs> it's the parents. <laughs> I used to have to deal with them all the time. Parents are the worst. It's the worst. The parents. Parents, if parents, <laughs> I used to get upset selling small guitars to children, talking to the parents. Um, uh, because I always wonder, like, if they use the same logic to buy a guitar as they did their safety equipment for their sports events, their kids would be dead. <laughs> Like parents come in and buy guitar stuff for their kids. And it's like, how? I just want this so cheap. I don't even care. Like if this thing gives them cancer. I don't care less. I could care about my kid. Just, just, I need the price to be this. So because the parents are so focused on that, and it's just the reality of this, they're not buying it for themselves. They're buying it for a kid. And most of the parents, and I'm telling you from experience, if I said half, I'm just being nice. If I said half the parents that came in and bought a guitar, didn't actually say at the register, they're probably not gonna do this. The half of them say that in front of their kid in front of me. I'm like, what the hell? It's like, it's imagine taking your kid to a restaurant and just be like, no, nah, he's not gonna eat this, but I'm gonna order it, but he's not gonna eat it. I mean, I know they do that too. But the whole point is, is that they, 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 the industry knows that. So to get a, to get this started, to get your future customer base, you gotta kind of subsidize your guitar pricing. So the, a lot of manufacturers that get into that business, because Fender, because uh, Fender is not in the, uh, believe it or not, <laughs> three quarters and half size guitars, they're not in that business. They're in the uh, s getting somebody started to buy a full size later Fender guitar. That's why if you notice a lot of companies that um, make inexpensive uh, half size and, and quarter size guitars really have a, a line for them to graduate through because they're just trying to get them started into their line and go that way. So, um, and that's why they don't put a lot of time and effort into guitars. And one of the things, if you guys watched, I have a video about this uh, that I do, how to do a setup on a three-quarter size instrument. Um, my nose is running. Huh. Um, my sinus has been killing me, by the way, because uh, Arizona, we don't have, like, it's fall, but in here, it's just all the stuff, all the plants are in there. But here's the interesting part. Um, I did the video where I show you guys that one of the things they do that really drives me crazy is they put small gauge strings. Do not put small gauge strings on a short scale guitar. You want to use thicker strings. So uh, if a normal guitar has uh, 10s or 9s, you definitely want to put 11 gauge strings on a three quarters instrument. It's because when you do decrease the tension, um, I, I tell you guys all the time, I play shorter scale basses, but on shorter scale basses, I play thicker gauge strings. And it, they feel the same. It feels the same. 11 gauge strings on a three quarters guitar feels like nine gauge strings on a full size guitar. And people are like, yeah, but it's harder for the kids. It's not harder for the kids. 
it's the same. <laughs> it's it's the same. It's it's, it's easier. Um, if you use smaller strings on a shorter scale guitar, what's going to happen is because the tension is decreased, the distance. Sorry, the distance distance is decreased. The tension's then decreased, and the strings become very messy, very uh, buzzy and crappy, and it drives people crazy. And so you can get the guitars dialed in a little bit with a slightly bigger string. And if you and because we do hybrid strings now, if that's something that really concerns you, and they're going to do a lot of bends because that's where they will have some trouble doing bends. But I don't notice a whole lot of little kids playing three quarter guitars and well in those Stevie Ray Vaughan licks but if they are you can get hybrids so you can give them a smaller uh, high E and B string and then go from there um, so so I hope that answers your question I wanted to grab that question because I, I like those kind of topics and then um, I think that's it I mean there's a bunch of other great questions of course but I can't get to everything um, is that it uh, and I just saw a super chat come in so we'll end on that Um, Paul, thank you for having, he says, have a beer. Uh, Daniel says, Hey, Phil, can you speak to the brand Hamer? Uh, what's the best era to look for? I very, I know very little about Hamer. Uh, you know, Hamer guitars. I mean, other than a lot of the guys I loved, like Vernon Reed played Hamers for a while. Um, you know, uh, some of my favorite guitar players ever, um, Gary Hoey had a Hamer guitar. I have very little experience with Hamer guitars. Um, when Hamer was big, I was poor. So like there was no Hamers. Hamers were like, uh, like, like I said, a lot of the high-end guitars like that, like ESP. It was just, there. you just didn't see them in the wild. Not, you know, where I could afford to buy guitars. They didn't have them there. And then by the time I was in the industry and, you know, had money and stuff, Hamers were pretty much gone. You know, it had been, it had been wiped out and now Hamers back, I think, but I think it's import only. I'd love to learn more about the new Hamers and, and tell you if there's new stuff. But um, what I know about the actual old ha brand of Hamer is that um, yeah, there are very few on reverb. And when there is, they're pretty expensive if they're the real ones. And the import ones, I don't know much about. So sadly, I know that's not a great answer to that question. But, um, you know, maybe that maybe it needs a maybe I need to put some time into that and learn more about them. Uh, you know, the, the old ones and the new ones. Like I said, I've only played a few of them. So to give you a reference, ESP is a, like real ESP, especially from the 80s and stuff, um, are very unique. And I've probably played 30 of them. Uh, Hamers, I've probably real Hamers from, you know, from back in the day, made in Connecticut kind of thing. Um, or even I think originally weren't they in New York? I, I just know I remember them from when they were owned by Cayman, which was uh, Ovation, you know, Ovation Hamer in Connecticut. Um, I've probably put my hands on four or five Hamers, maybe six. Real, you know, USA made ones. Import ones, I've put my hands on quite a few, but they've all been all over the place, so I don't know. So there you go. All right. I hope you guys, I thank you guys for hanging out, as always. I hope it was a good show for you. It was a good show for me. I had a lot of fun. Um, I have some cool videos coming this week, mostly. And also, I have a cool giveaway coming, which, like I said, I'm going to package up some really cool stuff. It's going to be like a, a package of cool things to do. Thank you guys so much uh, for hanging out, as always. I want to thank the moderators for taking care of everybody. Oh, that's the last thing I want to talk about, too. Uh, I saw in the comments, I saw, saw a few people were talking about ads, the, too many ads or whatever. Um, so as of, I think it was November 1st. I don't know if anything's changed again because it's December 1st. It might have got worse than December 1st. As of November 1st, um, YouTube took away uh, all YouTubers ability to insert ads. So it used to be, we, we had the ability to go in your videos and like place an ad. Okay. And, um, uh, this is just, uh, this is good. Cause I like at the end of the show, cause the people, you know, you're going to learn something a lot right now. <laughs> um, so anyways, you could insert an ad where you want. So I could put two ads in a video. I could put 10 ads in a video. Um, you need eight minutes in a video to do more than one ad. So, you know, so if you see a video and it's eight minutes or longer, if you ever notice a video is like eight minutes and eight seconds, it's cause somebody wants more than one ad. But, um, anyways, you could put in ads where you want, uh, on a show like this, two hours, I could put in, you know, 10, 20 ads, 50 ads, two ads, I could do whatever I want. Um, however, they took that away. So that means YouTube now places them. To give you a reference, when I was putting ads in my old shows, this show, the two hour show, I was putting like one at like 10 minutes and I'd do like one at 30 and then I put one at 50. And then one time um, I didn't do it. I forgot to put my ads in and YouTube auto put them in. They put 16 ads in the first 30 minutes. And their logic was, you could tell was, they were gonna bombard you with ads and and even though people were like, I just want to be 
I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna tell you guys exactly how it works. Um, even though the comment section was like, Phil, what's going on with your ads? And I didn't know. So I was like, I don't know. I don't know. I'm looking. Um, on a video where I could make $100, $200, $300 on a live show, which is a good amount of money to make on a live show, I think I made like 1200 bucks. I was like, what the hell? Because even though it pissed you guys off and literally half you guys didn't watch that show, you guys saw so many damn ads so quickly that it just it added up the revenue. So I was like, oh, that's horrible. I mean, they're crazy, right? So then I became aware that I got to make sure that I don't put it on the auto thing. Now it's on the auto thing. Now, here's what happened. So that's what's happened last month. So they're putting in the ads and they're going to, and I don't, uh, I'm just going to let you guys know, they're going to slam ads at the beginning. You're probably going to notice on all videos, especially long ones like this, the ads are not only there a lot, they're literally all fl flushed up to the front of the video. And then, cause they'd rather you, they, remember they don't care about you, <laughs> right? I care that I build this community cause this is, you know, what I care about. So I want you to stay. They care less. They're like, if you basically they get uh, less of you, but to watch more ads, that's more revenue for everybody. So they're going to do that. They're going to focus on that. Um, however, what I did notice today and I will pay attention. So, okay. Is that today for the first time, I've never seen this all last month, even though it switched last month today, I noticed that. I can select like a low, medium, high setting on the ads. I did not select high because I'm not an asshole. I selected medium because I didn't know, because they're not really telling you what that means. So I selected medium. If uh, listening to you guys, it sounds like it's a little, a little harsh because I don't know. Remember I'm using my logic. Like, I don't know. High is like 16. Medium's probably like four. Low's like one. I don't know. Maybe they, maybe they think medium's 15. So I'll adjust it. I'll adjust it down to low. Okay. So you guys know. Um, so I'll make the adjustment. I just want to let you know. And I, more importantly, I got to make sure that I can make that adjustment after I've created the video, but I will look when I do the indexing, but I'm letting you know, mom, not only to know what's going on now, but as you deal with other channels and you start noticing this one, you'll know, and maybe you can share with other YouTubers that may not no, because some of my YouTube friends did not pay attention that YouTube had did this, that they took away their ability to insert ads, which means they control how many ads go in and then this new feature today. So we'll adjust. Don't forget though. So, you know, okay. So, so you, so, you know, for now, okay, this is today, December 1st, 2023. So please don't quote me four years from now going, that's what you said, but you can buy YouTube premium. I have it. It's amazing. Okay. Um, if you can buy the family plan, okay. Um, the family plan is $25 a month, but you get six people, not six family. Ralph is on my plan. Ralph gets free ads. Cause I, I, you just select, you get six people. It's not like Netflix where they ought to be in your house. And if they go, you know, none of that stuff, just, you get six people, you, you insert six email addresses. So if you have that ability, it's amazing because it's like me, my kids. In fact, currently I only have five people on the plan. I try to give Ralph's girlfriend the free plan and she's like, I don't watch YouTube. So, <laughs> so I'm I like, so, um, so I have five people on the plan. So if you have six people, you can add that on the, on the plan. And what's great about that is not only do you not get ads, but here's the important part. You get to download everything, um, which is awesome, which is what I do. So you actually have all your, I, I put hours and hours of YouTube content in my phone and stuff and on my tablet. And so when I'm traveling, I have it. It's really cool. I, like I said, I just like it for that reason. It's just cool. Like I said, like, you know, somebody said ad blocker, ad blocker is not going to work on like phones and stuff. It's only going to work on your computers and stuff. And by the way, ad blocker also has some other ramifications that you don't know about because trust me, they're all going to get you somehow. Um, but I, whatever works for you guys works for you guys. I'm just letting you know, I have the premium plan. I've had it now for a couple years. Uh, $14 a month is pretty crazy for two people. Um, 25 is still a lot of money too, but I'm just letting you know if I'm a huge YouTube per person, which means I watch a lot of YouTube. So it's, it's paid dividends to me. I don't mind it that much. So I just let you guys know, uh, that's an honest review. I, YouTube doesn't give us crap. I don't get, <laughs> they don't, they don't, they don't give me a cheaper version. They don't give me anything. If you sign up, I have no interest in this. I'm just giving you my personal experience and what I pay and why I do it. All right. <laughs> the, real, the real Mrs. KYG said Ralph is family. Ralph is family. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah. Uh, but when they gave me six people, I was just like, I got to find two more people. <laughs> so there you go. All right, guys. Uh, as always, I want to thank you so much for your time till the next time. Uh, know your gear and then, oh yeah. And then now we do this. The know your gear podcast.